not had code. So. Well, I quarantine just because I don't like people. <laughs> That's how engineers and scientists are. We thought quarantine was a good deal. <laughs> So I like that. Meeting, yeah. All right, let's see. Yikes. So just to give you all a heads up, I'm up here in Metro Atlanta, and we're about to go through what I think y'all went through in Mobile earlier today. So I'm hoping the electricity stays on and I don't get blown up by lightning. It's not looking good right now. We haven't had anything too bad yet. Mm. Good. I saw Tuscaloosa and Birmingham was getting hammered earlier today in Huntsville. So our house was out of power for about two days. Hey, caramba. There's no bueno. Motor generator, one of the internet service providers went down, redundant internet, uninterruptible power supplies on the computers, plus they're mostly battery powered computers anyway. So we had meetings, you know, with 20 or 30 people during the events and just kept going. No problem. Good. <clears throat> just wondering whether I need a third redundant internet connection other than my cell phone. That's the... We're about to become an island here, this peninsula. Well, there comes a point in time where you just throw your hands up and say, I'll see y'all later. No, no, I'm still here. <laughs> still working, so. You know, one of the things that differentiates human beings is our ability to overcome nature. Temporarily, yes. Well, maybe more than that. I guess if you, if you wait until the heat death of the universe, yeah, it's temporary. But we might be able to get pretty close to that. Or is that the file you sent out via email earlier in the week? Um, it's had a few minor changes to it, but um, basically the same. Fred, if you're still listening, how are you feeling today? Is it wearing you out, or are you just another, just another? Uh, well, it's not cold wearing day. me out any more than it wore me out the day before, the day before that, and the day before that. You know, you go out for your morning walk, and a couple of days. Of I see you, Stephen. <laughs> You're muted, but you sound great. I, I, I've always been told that I'm better muted. <laughs> I see you, Stephen. 
I've got, a face, I've got a face made for radio, so I'm good. Indeed. <laughs> Let me get my official. Here. <laughs> I am returning. For some reason, it either restarted or otherwise went out of service. Did anybody else enjoy that? Yeah, I lost I lost Fred's audio while he was talking there. You know, he didn't miss it. In fact, I don't see I don't see Fred. Is he still with us? Yeah, that's yeah. Fred. Yes, I'm here. And here's my smiling face. Also stop my video just to preserve bandwidth. Um, we got a few minutes uh, for Deborah when you're ready to start. We'll pick back up and let me know. Stephen, are you on campus today? So I was. I was up to to about to 51 minutes ago, and I actually just just got to the house. And I was going to come hide in the basement over there with you guys. This stuff keeps looking as bad as it's looking. Yeah, the weather's pretty. The weather's pretty rough. Um, I'm in like North Cherokee County. It's pretty rough around here too. Yeah, I'm looking at the. Uh, sorry, everybody, for the inside baseball. But we're, I'm looking at the central deck, and it's like wrath of God type stuff coming in. I'm gonna hide under my desk. Duck and cover. So the weather started getting rough, <laughs> and the tiny Zoom session was, was tossed. Yes. Lost. If not for the courage okay. of the fearless crew, yeah, the session would be lost. That's correct. <laughs> so they ended up on an island called Monterey Peninsula. <laughs> <laughs> and poor Deborah's wondering, why did I invite these lunatics into this session? <laughs> what, what are they even talking about? <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, she wanted other lunatics, but they wouldn't show up. You know, we always need a higher class of lunatic. That's what I say.
Welcome, Jeremy. Good to see you. Muted, Jeremy. Thank you. <laughs> Likewise, Alec and Deborah. Good to see you. See you. Okay, so I, I thought you were actually in your office, Alec, but now I see that's a virtual yeah. background. Turns out I am in my office, though. You are? Yes, I actually am in the office today. Okay. And I am in mine. <laughs> and Fred is in his, that's right. When I'm in mine too, but not my work office. I'm in my home office. I'm in my work office, which is also my home office. I see. So as long as we're hanging around, Fred, are you inland far enough that you're not getting flooding? Well, the prediction right now is that the Monterey Peninsula is going to become an island in the next day or so. So, wow. so there's flooding around us, but I'm 50 feet off of uh, the ocean, 50 feet up. Oh, I thought you were, I thought you were more closer into uh, Livermore or something like that. Oh, no, I live in Pebble Beach. Um, oh, okay. For quite a while. If you look out there, that's, you know, you can look out and see the golf car, uh, golf oh. course in the ocean and you can see the ocean over there. But, uh, but it's, uh, we're about 50 feet up. So we don't have to worry about any of the waves or anything like that. And, uh, and the nature of where we live in particular goes outward, right? So if the ocean has some big wave that comes, chances are it'll come off the ocean before it gets up 50 feet and takes our house out. We did have 100 mile an hour plus winds a couple of days ago. Oh, that sounds fun. Just fine. We're in a forest. The trees fall down and kill people. Um, animals come along and try to eat people, usually smaller people. And, uh, you know, we're at the end of the line. So we had two days without power this week. But the motor generator and UPSs and redundant internet all kicked in properly. And we were never off the air, even during our live online remote meetings. Wow. Yeah. It costs an extra like two hundred dollars a month <laughs> to have all that redundancy. It's just right. ridiculously inexpensive to have really great reliability, even under you know serious storm conditions. Right. Yeah, where I used to live, I had a seventeen kilowatt generator, which was enough. Didn't power the entire house, but it meant that when we had a blizzard, we did not. We were not cold. <laughs> I think ours is uh, 240 kVA, so. Oh, that's a lot bigger. Oh yeah, yeah, 100 watts at, at uh, 240 volts or something like that. So we're good. Okay. Sorry, 100 amps at 240 volts. Mm -hmm. We try not to show off to our neighbors by because the you know when the lights are off for two days, some of our neighbors don't have this stuff, so we we invite them over. Which right. is, but we don't turn on all the outside lights and you know have projections going and big movie show or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I I remember a couple times inviting uh, neighbors to come over and warm up during the blizzard. Yeah. Well, we have very nice neighbors here too. I used to live somewhere that had terrible neighbors. And I wouldn't invite them over. <laughs> I, maybe if their house, actually one of them burned down their house. <laughs> Intentionally or not? There is some debate over that, but they got the insurance money and spent it on their drug dealing operation. I see. So that was a different neighborhood. I want to hear that story, not the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm here for that. 
What, was started. his name uh, John McAfee by any chance? Right. <laughs> no, no, he's a different type of insanity. <clears throat> now, the more interesting stories were, you know, things like when I was at Sandia and we had the, the procurement card briefing. And during the procurement, you know, a procurement card is basically a credit card that can be paid off of your accounts. So it's a government credit card. And you're allowed to spend it on specific sorts of things. And they have lists of what's allowed and not allowed and so forth. You can spend so much per month and so much on any individual item and so forth. So they did the briefing and such. And so I started to ask questions. Okay, so like if I'm on the border between, you know, Pakistan and Afghanistan, <laughs> and I have an opportunity to buy a suitcase sized nuclear weapon. My understanding is I can't buy it directly with a credit card, but I can buy other things of less than 10,000 each of the credit card at the end of one month and then get to that threshold the next month, do it again, convert all that to cash and then buy the weapon that way. And the, the person in front of the room said, oh, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> and everybody else in the room moved away. <laughs> They're just asking. That reminds me of the uh, case, and I think Anita has heard this story, and, and cut me off at any point when you're ready to, to start, Alec, where I got invited in for a conversation with the SEC um, and about uh, um, a company that I had uh, done a little bit of consulting for, and then they canceled it because the president of the company, his house mysteriously burned down with all the records in it. Um, and then he disappeared and they closed the investigation. And then a couple of years later, uh, long story short, he came back into my life um, and I called uh, the SEC investigator, whose name I still had. I said, are you still looking for so-and-so? And I said, yeah, he disappeared off the face of the earth. And I said, well, you might want to go look in such and such an agency because he's, a, he's working there now. And Jeremy, the rest I, I, the I work wow. in cryptocurrency. Nothing surprises me. <laughs> well, you should be surprised if a legitimate transaction takes place. Exactly. <laughs> We're going to give it one more minute to get started. We were missing about five or six people, but they're mostly from uh, this area of the country. So the weather may be um, causing some issues for a few people. So we'll give it one more minute. We'll get started. Wait a second. What's the weather in issue in Alabama? I knew about it, the issue in California. Um, we have severe storms passing through and oh. going from Alabama into uh, Tennessee and Georgia and oh, okay. leaving across the state. So. Right. Everything that was in California like three or four days ago is in Alabama now. Right. Okay. And, and everything in the next week that's here is going to be there then. <laughs> well, the, uh, the skiers aren't complaining, is my understanding. Uh, they had to shut down most of the ski resorts because there was too much snow. The buildings were under uh, snow cover. Well, they'll, they'll still take that. Okay, well, we have people coming in and out, um, which may be weather related or Zoom related, and we're still missing a couple, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I know most of y'all, if not all of you know Alex. Um, I'm Deborah Chapman. I'm the Associate Dean and the Graduate Director here in the School of Computing at the University of South Alabama. Um, and I've worked with Alec for many, many years. Um, and we have um, worked to put this workshop together in conjunction with the trusted CI team that was um, with um, Vaughn at the University of Indiana and moved to the University of Illinois um, over the summer. Um, so um, Alec, do you wanna introduce yourself or say anything in terms of yeah, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, it's uh, uh, great to get together with uh, you folks, many of the faces I haven't seen in a little while. 
Uh, but there's others that I have. I work on a pretty regular basis with Jeremy, and I've been working with Fred some, but it's good to see the rest of the folks. And uh, I wish we were able to be together face to face. That would be fantastic just for old time's sake and, and getting past the COVID uh, uh, lockdowns that we weren't able to travel and get to see folks I've missed seeing the faces and having the interactions. Uh, but I believe you all know this uh, effort started uh, about seven or eight years ago uh, with uh, several folks contributing uh, from NSF. Anita uh, Nikolic is, was a pivotal in getting us moving with this, and I'll have more to say about that. Uh, soon, and and there were several others that got uh, got us going on doing the TTP thing. And I will have a short uh, video about the, that I'd like to to show here in just a few minutes uh, about Becky uh, to as as a uh, just a reflection of the time she's been gone now for a while, and it's probably not a bad time to just remember some of the contributions that she made. So I'll do that. Uh, but the uh, more important task here is that uh, about uh, six or seven or eight years ago, we worked with NSF to get started trying to promote tech transfer to practice as a, uh, a uh, an issue that would was going to, to carry on with NSF with, with multiple projects and to try and encourage faculty members that, that academic researchers that receive funding Prime, and, and where I got started was with cybersecurity funding uh, to try and take those projects into the uh, into use. And so uh, we were able to put together several uh, different issues, and I'll have some slides on that too. But uh, I've uh, been working here with Deborah, and before uh, Deborah, actually Michael Chambers here at University of South Alabama, who we'll hear from tomorrow. Uh, played a large role with Becky and myself. The four of us here have done uh, a lot of work together on TTP. And so we were uh, eventually brought in uh, with the Trusted CI program to, to re-energize those efforts. Uh, and uh, Florence Hudson, who will be here uh, later on, will also join in and share with those uh, issues. And, and I'll, I'll owe, owe a big round of thanks also to Vaughn, uh, whom I'll thank here in just a moment. But uh, anyway, again, I'm Alec Yassensack. There are a few here on that don't, I know I don't, don't recognize off the top of my head, but uh, I uh, came from Florida State to the University of South Alabama. I've been here 14 and a half years, and I uh, can't thank you all enough for joining the workshop. And uh, I hope that we can uh, work together, continue to work together on this, and, and over the next two, three to five years, do some great things uh, with uh, tech transfer to practice and and um, use some real innovations to make this a a growing field, if you will, uh, in the community. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you, Alec. Um, I'd like to take a minute um, and let everybody um, that's on um, introduce themselves. Um, the easiest way is for me just to call on people as I see them on my screen. Um, so the next person up, um, Anita, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background with TTP and your um, interest or participation um, in the workshop? Sure. Uh, I'm Anita Nicholich. I'm University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, prior to this, I was at NSF, program director, and uh, dealt with the uh, TTP program at NSF. Um, uh, my interest is, I'm, I'm currently, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, I'm currently in the NSF Convergence Accelerator Program, which is a, a riff on TTP, and I've uh, kind of seen some uh, synergies and things that can be leveraged to do TTP better. Um, I'm also, I sold one startup in May and I'm at a different startup now around cryptocurrency, great timing. Um, so maybe like some perspective from transitioning research to real world stuff. Uh, I can hopefully help with that. Great, thank you. Um, Vaughn. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. Alec for inviting me. I'm Vaughn Welch, uh, formerly at Indiana University and formerly director of Trusted CI. I've been uh, retired now for about six months and uh, frankly just flattered when anyone still cares to hear my opinion. Thank you. Jeremy? Good afternoon. I'm Jeremy Epstein. Uh, I'm at NSF. Uh, I lead the SATSI program, uh, which is where some of this stuff came out of. Had the pleasure of working with Anita for a number of years. Um, I was also the uh, initial um, uh, program manager for the Convergence Accelerator that Anita uh, mentioned. So uh, uh, I have a lot of interest, uh, having spent most of my career in industry uh, in uh, improved tech transfer. Okay. Fred? 
Okay, I'll just get unmuted and depicted. Here we are. I'm Fred Cohen. I run Angel to Exit, where we help grow companies. And I also run Management Analytics, Trusted Advisor, since 1977. And I've done a lot of cybersecurity throughout my extensive career and transitioned a lot of it to practice. So I was asked to join for that purpose and obviously to help um, people and companies uh, transition technology into practical application, hopefully at scale. Great. Um, Andy? Hi everyone, Andy Gray. I'm an assistant professor of information security and assurance here at Kennesaw State University in Metro Atlanta. I'm the coordinator for the Bachelor of Business Administration in Information Security and Assurance. I have very little exposure to the TTP program and I saw the email and I said, maybe I should duck into this thing and, and check it out and learn a little more about it. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Steven? Hey everyone. Um, so thanks for letting me go after Andy. Um, so my name is Stephen Gay. I think I may be the statistical anomaly in this group. Um, I, uh, so I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Kennesaw State University. Um, I am not a researcher, nor am I a faculty member. Um, I do have a degree in cybersecurity. I have presented at Educause multiple times. Um, I've seen trusted CI from the outside. Um, I am a practitioner uh, leading a team of nine. Uh, so for me, this, this conversation is really more ultimately, how can I help facilitate research uh, using the technologies that we have and ultimately working with my researchers, if there's something they do want to bring to practice, um, what are the avenues that y'all have created, you know, best practices that ultimately we can learn from. Um, so really, really excited to be here and thank y'all for having me. Thank you. Um, Tom? Hey, I'm Tom Boyle uh, with Kennesaw State as well. And the wind has just really kicked up just now. So, um, yeah. but internet's hanging in there. Uh, I, I guess similar to Stephen, uh, who's working out of the central, I work out of the office of research. And so I have some of the same interests, but maybe my, uh, our bosses have different <laughs> uh, priorities, right? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, Matthew? Good afternoon. I hope uh, you can hear me. Um, Matthew Gilly, I'm a professor at McNeese State University. Um, I, this is my first exposure with you guys and the program. And uh, my interest is to develop the, the cybersecurity and networking uh, program at McNeese. We already have a few courses um, certified in some of the Cisco certification programs, uh, professional training, and so on. We recently had um, established a, a networking lab. We're trying to use this virtual lab uh, with Cisco pods, um, you know, to uh, promote some research with our senior and graduate student at McNeese. Well, I'm so eager to learn more about you and how to move this forward, um, you know, from uh, academic to industry. We have a lot of industry around Southwest Louisiana, and they are really interested to get involved with us. So thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, Chris? Uh, yeah, let me see if I can turn off. <laughs> All right, there you go. So I'm Chris Kutsugeras. I'm a professor of computer science at uh, uh, Southeastern Louisiana University. It's in Hammond, north of uh, New Orleans, the other side of the lake. And um, I heard about this uh, meeting recently from the department head who forwarded the announcement. We are starting also a track in cybersecurity at the department. And um, I wanted to get a little bit more informed, see uh, what venues are available. And uh, I thought I would join uh, this opportunity to learn more about opportunities and things that I should know. I'm not primarily a cybersecurity person, although uh, it's hard to define that, but uh, I'm, um, uh, 
basically computer engineering, uh, computer science, mostly working with uh, applications in robotics and artificial intelligence. I've done um, a lot of internet applications uh, in my classes and projects. And so cybersecurity is uh, pertinent. And I wanted to know more as much as possible. And uh, that's why I joined this and I enjoy the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Great, thank you. We're so excited to have everybody here. We have a good mix of people, um, those very familiar with TTP, those not familiar really at all. Um, so there's, oh, I'm sorry, I left off as uh, Jehi. Hi, uh, my name's Jihei Yun. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Red Shred. Um, we are a uh, company that does document understanding and complex um, natural language processing, understanding and to turn data into um, readily usable forms for XR, VR, voice, et cetera. Uh, my connection to this is uh, Becky Bass used to be a mentor. And so anything Becky or commercialization is of interest. Great. Thank you. Sorry about leaving you out on that one. Um, so we are excited to have, have y'all and hopefully we have um, a lot of good interaction, a lot of good communication and a lot of good information shared over the next um, two days. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Alec. Um, I did send everyone an updated copy of the agenda in the chat um, that, and we're going to try our best to stick to that as best we can. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Alec who has the first session on an introduction to TTP. That's right. And um, uh, again, thank you all very much for joining. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I allowed one of my screens to expire, so I have to find it real quickly. Uh, what I wanted to start out doing is to, again, uh, just to reflect a moment uh, on Becky's uh, contributions and on her life. And so uh, we have a, a video that uh, I did for a memorial that was done for Becky. And I'm going to uh, share that with you now, if I Alice, can do that. I, yes. would you, for the people who are new to the um, topic, can you um, introduce who Becky is? I, I certainly will. Um, Thank you. That's the, not the screen I want to share. Tag on it. So I didn't get it. I, I practiced this just a few minutes ago and had everything like I wanted it. And now I've lost my way, haven't I? That's my face there. And that's the one I want to share. And I apologize for this. I have everything just like I wanted it. Yeah, I'm going to start over here. Okay, so before I start the video, that's a picture of me. Before I start the video, uh, Becky Bass has uh, been around the cybersecurity world uh, uh, since uh, uh, for a long, long time. Now, she passed suddenly in 2017. While uh, uh, she was on the on the staff here and working with us on this project, uh, she and and Fred and uh, it, Jeremy and some of us have known her for a long, long time. Uh, she was a, a very special lady, and this video, uh, like I say, I did combine some some text with some pictures to give it a little bit of look into her life. And so I think this will will give you an, a good idea of who Becky was. If you don't know who she was, hopefully those of you that know her, this will be a uh, a positive reflection. Can everybody see my ugly mug there? Yes. Thank you. Here, let me go ahead and start this. Alec, we can't hear the video. Okay, thank you again. That is my fault. There is a little button that I have to push to do this to get the video, the audio to start. Thank you for letting me know. Hey, gone it. My apologies. Practice is supposed to make perfect, isn't it?
That will work. Okay, the audio will get better once it goes into the picture. So here you go. He has a long history in the state of Alabama, having been here in 1955. Leeds is a small town just outside Birmingham, Alabama. One of Leeds' claims to fame is that it is the birthplace of Charles Barkley. Charles Barkley is an NBA basketball star. In fact, he was considered to be one of the top 50 players of all time just a few years ago. As a superstar basketball player, Charles was a great scorer, rebounder, and defender in the NBA. He was feared by opponents on the floor and had a flamboyant personality that kept him in the press. Above all, Charles Barkley was a winner. While Barkley was certainly a great basketball player, in my book, Leeds' greatest claim to fame is the birthplace of Becky Bass. Becky was also a superstar in her field. By most accounts, was one of the top 10 women of all time in cybersecurity and was named by SC Magazine as one of the top cybersecurity influencers in the world as of just last year. Like Charles Barkley, Becky was a prolific scorer. She made an impact in a multitude of ways, from spurring research and intrusion detection and other cybersecurity fields well before anyone heard of cybersecurity, to helping entrepreneurs grow their businesses, to helping venture capital firms grow their portfolios, to take her skills back to government as VP for research at NQTEL. At USA, Becky scored by winning grants, five as PI or co-PI in just five years, and was an influencer on several other awarded grants. An amazing accomplishment, particularly given, particularly so given that she did so in the early stages of the USA research program. Becky was an amazing scorer. Becky was also a great defender. She was an adamant defender of ideas. There was no more fierce advocate for her clients than Becky Bass. She would readily engage critics cutting through the haze to show the idea's merits. Becky also defended her friends and clients. She didn't put up with negative comments about her friends, even in jest. Don't ask me how I know. Becky was a prolific rebounder. Becky endured some highly traumatic episodes in her life, from family tragedy to discrimination to health problems to professional peaks and valleys. But Becky rebounded, and she was always good for a smile and a hug, no matter what. There's no doubt Becky was a superstar in her field, and through that, she changed the world. Becky was a winner. But at her core, Becky was a people person. I will always remember Becky as being a superstar for people. She had a heart for the underprivileged and the downtrodden. She devoted substantial time working on issues that are important to women and minorities. Becky loved people. She was an avid user of electronic communication and social media, but Becky was best face-to-face. -face. She loved to be with people. One day recently, Becky came to my office with a problem. It turns out she felt like she was being, in her words, tied to her desk by some of the administrative requirements of her position as chief strategist here. It was all that I could do to not bust out laughing. As you well know, Becky is a prolific traveler. Mobile, Alabama today, DC tomorrow, day after tomorrow, the Valley, stops in her Arizona on her way back the following week, then to New York the week after, then a train back to DC, followed by a shortened stay in Birmingham to see her family, then back to Mobile and to that very lonely desk that she left. Becky was best face to face, and Becky Bass was about people. It's cliche to say, but Becky was truly one of a kind. The professional gap will remain. She will be missed by all that knew her, but her legacy lives on in her professional accomplishments and in the lives that she touched. Mine was one. May Becky rest in peace, and may God bless each of you as we cope with her loss. Again, thank you for allowing me to join you today. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to share that with you. And uh, so now I'll jump into the uh, to the presentation, to my slides, and uh, we'll get going. Unless someone has something else they would like to, uh, to say about that at this point. Any comments or thoughts? Well... This doesn't make perfect. It gets obvious.
All right. So let me start out by giving some acknowledgments here. And I've already mentioned uh, Anita and Vaughn and uh, Kevin Thompson and uh, Rob Beverly have all been uh, critical in making this happen. Most recently, uh, Rob, uh, I mean, Vaughn went bent over backwards to help us uh, to connect uh, with the TTP through his uh, uh, trusted uh, cyber infrastructure program that he ran for several years, uh, who created, he originated it, created it, did a great job with it, and then, and then spread the wealth by uh, incorporating us in it. We owe him a big uh, round of thanks for that. But uh, I assure you this not, would not have happened if, were it not for Anita. Anita had the vision and the energy and the uh, willingness to work with us and the patience. Any of you know that work with me, it takes some patience to work with me. And uh, she did that and uh, uh, brought us through and, and we did some uh, really great things. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, creating a um, uh, two or three different workshops that we had conducted in 2014. Uh, workshop and and then we also did another one in 2015 and we have, have done several others since uh, with different issues uh, with different things going on in each of these different workshops uh, to continue this notion we uh, uh, between myself and Michael Chambers and Becky we probably presented at uh, a dozen PI meetings at NSF so our while our efforts uh, have uh, kind of pivoted around cybersecurity they're certainly not exclusively there. Uh, several different areas of interest. The notion here is we are uh, hoping to try and transition, help to encourage transition of cybersecurity, of, of, of federally funded research in the technology area, cybersecurity, machine learning, uh, um, uh, cyber physical systems, other areas where it makes sense to use these, tech these capabilities, these techniques to be able to move uh, uh, research uh, areas, er things into uh, into practice. So what I'm going to do is give a, a, a short 25, 20, 25 minute brief on, on TTP. And it's a, a very uh, elementary to some of you, but I think it'll, it'll show something maybe new to, to several, uh, to all of us to give us some, uh, some things to think about that we may not have seen. But I geared it to allow even the most entry level uh, faculty members to see this and to understand where I'm going. So uh, as you more senior folks uh, are here, I hope you'll weigh in when you have uh, uh, comments to make and, and let me know if I'm missing anything or if there are things that uh, I'm, I'm not stating uh, accurately. The, the whole notion of TTP is to put, to put research results into use. And, and uh, when I say use, uh, I, uh, I don't, I mean use beyond continuing research. When we like to think that our research is always used, uh, you you build up things in your research portfolio, you, you publish papers and those papers are read and that's use, there's no doubt that that's use. Uh, we build up presentations when we present our research for people to have. And then we also have that daggone code base that we have. Now, generally a research code base is some kind of spaghetti conglomeration of things uh, it's a, a little bit difficult to use, but that's where a lot of uh, research goes into the to the code base, whether it's a GitHub or a subversion or where it sits in the particular environment. But what we are, are trying to do is go into what you'd call more functional use. And we talk about functional use uh, and we're really talking about about products and services. And, and in our area, we can be talking about sensors or network devices. Intrusion detection, again, I mentioned about Becky, that was one of Becky's uh, key areas in her early career was funding the early intrusion detection research. But even med the medical field we have here at South Alabama, we have a healthcare information system and faculty members doing advanced research and technology transfer in the medical field to uh, for devices that can help patients, that can help fac uh, staff and doctors and nurses in the hospital actual products, physical products that combine computing resources uh, with software and procedures and policies that can improve uh, services uh, to uh, uh, patients. Uh, the services themselves uh, is a area that's very rich for uh, TTP, particularly in, in uh, the areas where we work. 
Security is one of the key areas where we see this happen. It's also a very difficult area to have where to engage TTP because of the nature of those services that are provided. And uh, you'll hear a lot more about that over the next uh, a few hours of uh, presentations we have in this workshop. Fred will go into that ex extensively. But being able to uh, transition machine learning algorithms and approaches and implementations of machine learning uh, uh, human resources systems, of course, IT services are, are also critical to the, the things that, that can be transitioned in, in these areas. And so uh, these are all ideas and concepts of TTP that we, uh, we intend to engage. Now, there are two really distinct processes for TTP that I want to emphasize here in the next couple of minutes. Uh, informal TTP uh, can happen anytime in any place. And, and we all should be doing some of this uh, in, in our field and in our areas. So for example, free distribution of the technology that we uh, are engaging in the, the laboratory is a form of TTP. So the I, I'll give you an example of over lunch. When I was first here at South Alabama, uh, one of our uh, members for our, of our advisory board asked me to lunch, and I went to lunch with him, and he said he heard that I had done work in security protocols, and he wanted to run a, an algorithm by me. And so we sat over lunch, and we talked about the issue of what he needed to protect and how it needed to be protected, and how that uh, the uh, work that I had done related to the issues that he was engaging. Now that's technology transfer. It's informal technology transfer. It's transfer in the small. Uh, it, it probably hasn't had a great impact, but it is technology that is currently embedded in a operating system today as we speak. And so it's, it is a form of technology transfer. Uh, consulting is a form of technology transfer, the ability to look, take what you learn in the laboratory and put it out in the field to, to advise people and help them move forward. Uh, local industry is also an extremely way to have uh, technology transfer. I've got a more extensive uh, illustration of how to work with local industry in the next slide, so I'll not go into that here. Um, and uh, and then I have, there are other things I can't, let me see, I can't actually see that. See what that says. Okay, still can't see what that says on your own, right? Okay, so the point in this bullet was that these are things that you can do on your own. So even if you're an assistant professor that's never engaged a technology transfer, these are things that you really don't need someone to advise you. You don't need to be at this workshop necessarily to do this, although you may pick up some tidbits and it could be helpful for you to be here and engaged in this kind of uh, consultation about it. But the bottom line is informal TTP is, can be done on your own. Now, formal TTP is what I'd call TTP in the large. That's where uh, you have more people involved, more money involved, potentially more liability involved. The business processes are engaged. Uh, you have things like licensure and you have spinoffs. So you may be working with a company on a particular technology and rather than, than you developing a license for that technology, they may prefer that you be a business or you may prefer that you be a business. And then when you start doing those kinds of things and then moving on to the, what is, I think people canonically think of a, a TTP technology transfer to practice uh, of being a startup uh, then, then you've got major investment involved. You've got a lot of different issues involved. And, and let me back up and, and emphasize here that spinoff is not something that just happens with a company. A lot of times a spinoff will occur because an agency is engaged with academia. And there are things that, that uh, can be done to help that government agency or that government laboratory uh, through academia that really needs to be sustained and that sustainability is not able to happen unless you spin off some kind of a uh, of an organization that makes that has some durability to it in the long term. So they can happen for lots of reasons, uh, but that's uh, again where we've gone into uh, formal uh, TTP. And there are lots of other ways to do that. This is not all inclusive. I give you these just to use an example. Now, with all of these, the chances are good that you'll need help. That this is not something that. Certainly not a junior faculty member can take off on uh, take on their own. Probably a, a, a senior faculty member, unless they've done extensive amounts of this and have an infrastructure built up 
uh, they're going to need help uh, to be able to get uh, this done and to move their product into a, a place where it can be used. Now, let me back up to the informal uh, TTP to talk about a local industry approach. Here at the University of South Alabama, we've engaged our industry partners with a, a, a academic software development team approach. And this is run out, well, it's run out of our center. But the notion is we'll put together a group of one to three master students or one to four undergraduate students or a couple of undergraduate students along with a non-tenure track faculty member as a team. So that, uh, that you, of course, we expect to get the students tuition paid and we get a bit of salary for that faculty member to uh, be able to get and, and have industry experience when they carry this uh, knowledge and expertise of, of things that they're working on a real world project with a real world partner. They take that back into the, the classroom as well. And it's a, a very nice, model for doing a, a bit of tech transfer in the small. The cost of this, just to give you an idea, is about a, a, between $100,000 and $125,000 a year. So depending on how much you're going to pay, and you, you pay the students, how, what kind of students you get and how many of them you need. You can use an instructor. We can generally get the, about $20,000 a year for the instructor salary. And then there's some overhead that goes on to that. Of course, the vice president of research is going to always get uh, a, an overhead amount for that. So the annual cost of this, again, between $100,000 and $125,000. I've never seen that this model any place except the University of South Alabama. So I've been promoting it when I've had an opportunity and uh, that, that it is a, a way to be able to engage industry partners uh, on, a, on a formal level. This is run from our center. And, and the key here is you do have to have a center director. And the center director has to understand business and has to understand how to be able to market the services that are available in these application uh, programming teams. Now, it's a lot easier than, or I'm sorry, it, it's different. It has some real advantages over being a commercial entity because the uh, talent pool is, re, uh, is renewable. Here, when our students come through, they work on these projects, and a, a student may work for the same company on projects year after year, uh, or they may not. But the bottom line is, the student they're new students every year. Uh, one of the big issues that we engaged early on as we developed this was recognizing that academia is not well set for creating contracts for this type of service. And so we were able to create a set of template contracts and a process for getting the contracts in place to make these hundred to one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar project teams work. Uh, the center director is uh, they do the marketing. They go out and meet the industry partners and figure out what their needs are and how to bring them in, and then they cultivate that relationship. I'll, as an aside, I'll mention that we had expected when we started this that faculty members would be uh, out beating the bushes looking for these kinds of projects as well. But over the past several years, we've really not seen very much of that at all. The center director is really responsible for having generated most of our projects. And it's been a very lucrative for our students. We probably had in, in the last uh, five to seven to 10 years, we probably had over 100 students funded uh, through this, uh, this uh, soft, if you will, tech transfer process. I'll also point out that it also allowed us to have a lot of flexibility in submitting a, a proposal to a uh, NSF uh, industry university uh, uh, research center, uh, collaborative research center, and, and of winning that award several years ago, of being able to develop small teams to meet small cost projects that are uh, facilitated uh, in this uh, NSF program. So it was uh, very valuable from that standpoint as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll hit a few bullets now, and this is where I think most folks would look for TTP, the formal TTP side. And I, I've got four four techno four bullets that I'm going to show you here with some some bubbles that go around them. Uh, and 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 uh, I want to highlight what I think are some important aspects of this. When when we think of doing technology transfer to practice in academia, we have to stop thinking about research and start thinking about R and D. We have to stop thinking about writing papers 
and about how what we are working on can go into practice. And that means we've got to start thinking about customers and users as we develop our technology. It just rarely happens that the technology that comes out of the research pipeline is ready for uh, uh, is ready for use. A second thing we have to think about is that our laboratories typically have code that is spaghetti code. It is things that we've done proofs of concept. We've done demonstrations so that we can do the presentations to back up the things that we put in our papers. But when we go to a client or we go to a prospective client or a prospective funding agency or or someone that, that may use that technology or may support this technology in some way, the, poly, the, the product needs to be polished. And that's not something that academia routinely teaches uh, uh, in, in computer science. We have to have a production environment. We have to be able to sustain the technology once we get it. Even just to market that technology, you have to consistently have a production uh, a copy available. And, and again, in academia, Typically, when a student leaves, that student's products are rarely ever updated as they were. They may be transitioned into another student's environment or library, but we don't have the processes in place. And then we have to have the overall sustainability of our operations to keep those things going over time for a, 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 a technology transfer. Computer scientists are also, and technologists in general, tend not to be business persons. And, and when you say the word business plan to me, I just shiver, right? It's like Mufasa, right? It's the, the business plan, Mufasa. And that's the same thing to me. And so when you decide you're going to TTP and you're going to do it in the large, there has to be some notion of business. And then this other ugly word that comes up with technology transfer is there's if you're going to do technology transfer in the large, it's going to generally require funding. It's almost it's inevitable that if in order to expand research in a real meaningful impactful way there's going to have to be some external funding for uh, for different things that I think again you'll see as we go on if you haven't already but those are things that you'll see marketing now we all think we can market we can market ourselves we know what an elevator talk is we can do that stuff but the fact of the matter is we can't as computer scientists we don't understand how those things work we also don't get this notion of risk management of 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 uh how a company how a company can lose itself in a hurry uh and and remember if you start a company there are going to be company employees that now depend on that company business that take the job because they didn't and didn't take some other job. And so now you've made a commitment to those employees and the risks to the uh, uh, are things that we don't really understand very well. There are legal aspects to starting a company that are extremely important. I had no idea honest to goodness, when I came to University of South Alabama, how difficult it is to create a contract that accomplishes the goals of both organizations involved in that contract. There are so many things that influence the viability of a particular contract in a particular scenario. Having legal assistance is just absolutely essential and pivotal. Again, academia, we do have access to a council, a university council that can help us with these things. And there are legal resources that are provided through Technology Transfer Office too. But, but uh, these are things you have to think about. Similarly, liability. If if we do, if we have a company, particularly say a healthcare company that has technology that's uh, not hitting the button or that that creates a lot a problem, then the university and the people that create that company could all be at liability, depending on how we proceed with that. And having legal help to identify that is huge. IP protection. What you know? Do you talk about a complex field? Understanding what IP is. And, and how you can protect it, how you lose it, how you need to have protections in place is just beyond computer scientists. And so we also have this notion of HR and somebody's got to build and retain the team. We'd like to think that we have enough friends, enough colleagues, enough connections, we can do it. But the fact is we don't. Now, this is maybe the most important bubble on this whole presentation here is that I've just touched the, the uh, bare bones edge of the iceberg here. There are so many things that if you are in the large in TTP, 
that you've got to be thinking about. And so uh, fortunately, you can get help. Uh, that uh, almost all universities that do any substantial research have a tech transfer person or a tech transfer staff that is often run out of, uh, uh, I will, and I'll give you a slide on that in just a minute. NSF has some resources and I'll show you some USA resources. I know I'm probably running at the end of my time here, but maybe Deborah will allow me to go for, for just a minute. And then a couple of other thoughts that I'll give to you to, to close out on, uh, on A2E. Uh, usually the uh, university tech transfer office is in the vice president for research, and that's where ours is at South Alabama. And the goal is to promote innova innovation. And, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow morning, but my experience is that office first priority turns out to be protecting the university. And that means that they want to protect the university against liability, and they want to protect the IP. And, and not always just protecting the IP against the uh, folks that you're trying to sell to, but even against the folks that are trying to package it up, the students that are on your team and faculty members on your team. And so the university will have things in place that may make it difficult for you to promote your product and to market your product and to use it simply because of processes. And so you've got to be able to navigate that when you go to the University Tech Transfer Office, and Michael Chambers will give you some, some good uh, discussion of that tomorrow morning, and you, that's a question you maybe can ask him during his question and answer time. Uh, your Tech Transfer Office may also provide some services that you might call incubator, like uh, in, a, in the uh, protection of your IP, office spaces, pooled staff, mailing addresses, and things like that. So you can get help from your Tech Transfer Office. Uh, I also would, uh, in, in just a moment, I'll, I'll go ahead and show you this slide, and then when I get through with the uh, slide presentation, I'll, I'll ask for just a moment to go back and show you a couple of web pages off of this web page. This is really a pretty extensive set of resources that have emerged from the work that we did under Anita's guidance and direction, uh, and, and this web page on the University of South Alabama web pages has a lot of stuff out there that's pretty helpful. So just going through that can be very helpful to you as a faculty member who's who's doing TTP, but also to help students and faculty understand, as students and junior faculty understand what the TTP process is. And I'll, again, hopefully I'll have another minute uh, left over when I get uh, through the slides here. So this project is one of the resources you have. And again, I'll, I'll show you that web page. The NSF uh, has several different programs that actually promote tech transfer to practice. The i program, again, Michael Chambers, I suppose, or Deborah will talk about that in more depth. Uh, I highlight it as, as one of the things, though, that is goes beyond just being a funding vehicle. i provides some funding, but in my, of, of what I know of i one of the most important things it provides is some mentoring and some teaching and some instruction on things that you need to do to be successful in a business. Um, and, and the SBIR program has some of that, some notion, STTR, I'm not so sure about. The, the IUCRC program is, again, very valuable, has been valuable to me and the University of South Alabama while I've been here because it's allowed our faculty members to create long-term relationships with industry partners that can afford to fund some true R&D activities. And so those are our uh, NSF uh, programs. The core programs also have uh, TTP transition programs within their core solicitations. And so you just need to go ahead, go back and read, for example, the SATC solicitation and see how you would uh, ask for money to take a uh, uh, completed research into practice under a funded project and to see what resources they might provide. And maybe Jeremy or, or Anita or someone could uh, give us some more details of the current projects here at the end as we go. And that's uh, et cetera. And that's, uh, that's then for uh, questions. And so if you will, uh, Deborah, allow me to jump back to one more time to my web page. And, and I have shared that web page address in the chat box too. So. Great. Okay. So this is one of the things that you'll find on that web page. And what this is, is one variety of documentation uh, of our one of our workshop discussions. And you'll see some of the names and uh, names in here of the folks that were at this workshop. Uh, Anoop, uh, are you out there? 
Chen C. I Wang. I am, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chen C. Wang was our college, and Noop and I are, 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 uh, uh, went, went to the University of Virginia together, and uh, we're in the That's same right. research group. And Chen C. was in that research group as well. Uh, Jim Basney is now on our mm -hmm. CI program uh, project, and he was uh, at this uh, workshop. Uh, many of you may know Inger uh, Manga or Yulf uh, Ulquist that uh, is now at SRI. And so a lot of folks did these things. But if you see, there are several pages here of description of issues that were discussed about opportunity identification for TTP. Uh, why is it critical? If I knew then, if I knew then what I know now, what I would do, several pages of discussion of how that went. Uh, and I will just mention that they're also, uh, Michael Chambers put out some amazing scenarios to give you uh, issues that if you have someone that wants to do this type or that type of TTP, what kind of decisions would you have to make? How would you go about making those decisions? Some really phenomenal information on those web pages. I don't take credit for it. I pointed at other folks. Becky did great things and Michael did great things but it turned out being a fantastic resource. So uh, I, I wanted to point you to it and Deborah, thanks for, for sharing that. And so I've gone over just by a couple of minutes. Hopefully if, if there's time, we'll be if there are any questions, there'll be time for that. Anyone have any questions for Alec? Jeremy, would you have any? Suggestions on our TTP options in the in the that pro in the SATC program or Anita, one of you would might have some something to share there. I am no longer, you know, uh, an influencer, but Rob Rob is on. I don't know if Rob is on the call. I saw him join earlier. Yep, Rob he's joined. here. And in addition to Rob, uh, Cliff Wang uh, recently joined uh, our team from the Army Research Office, and he is uh, leading our uh, TTP efforts, uh, working with Rob on that. Yeah, I'm I'm here, Alex. Sorry. Hey, um, no worries. And I, and I'm yeah. I, I I have a bunch of uh, you know. Maybe I'll save my comments for a bit a bit later and you know speak to some of my experience uh, in in Satsi. But I, I I think you know just more generally, uh, NSF and and Satsi are uh, you know committed to to transition efforts, and you see this in in as you said several solicitations. Thank you. That's all I've got, Deborah. Okay, Alec, do you want to um, introduce the first um, panel? Okay. Um, this is uh, the starting from ground zero panel, right? Mm -hmm. So again, the notion here is we brought in a, a strong group that uh, understands what it means uh, to start at the beginning. And so I will uh, allow our chair to step up and go ahead and uh, uh, introduce the, themselves and the panelists. Hi, um, Ji Hei Yun, uh, founder and CEO of Redshred. Uh, Becky Bass uh, was an early mentor and um, been building our business, uh, really starting from ground zero with uh, Sibbers and um, getting to commercial customers. So that's us and I'll be moderating this panel. Um, I'm going to let Anoop go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Hey, uh, nice to see some small friends here like Angelos uh, and meet some new ones as well. So my name's Anoop. Um, let's see. I have a little bit of an academic background and probably a lot more of a commercial background. Also some government. I spent time at DARPA as a program manager for a few years. Um, transitioned to George Mason University, where Angela Stavro and I worked together. And I started a company out of George Mason on an STTR contract. I heard that mentioned. And uh, we spun it out. It was called Invincio. Um, uh, grew it from a very small startup to uh, exiting to a, a larger security company called uh, Sophos, uh, which is based in the UK. Uh, since, since selling it, um, I spent some time at Accenture Security as the Managing Director of Managed Security Services. Also, I ran a, another cybersecurity called Fidela Cybersecurity, and uh, recently have started a new cybersecurity company. Uh, we're still in stealth right now, but happy to be here. Nice to meet you all. Thanks, Anoop. 
Um, Angelo, if you could go next. Yes, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trending between academia and the commercial. I'm currently a full professor at uh, Virginia Tech, responsible for entrepreneurship efforts here at Virginia Tech in Northern Virginia. And at the same time, um, we had um, a company called uh, CryptoWare, now Quokka. And uh, that company received 21 million from USVP, uh, US Venture Partners and uh, Crosslink. Um, the, the company is doing great. We have reached the, I think right now they're at 16 million ARR. Uh, and then uh, now we are also uh, spanning off some, helping students to span off companies uh, from Virginia Tech. Uh, and trying to formalize a more a, a curriculum that will allow the students basically to understand the gaps that actually, uh, you know, I'm sure Anoop and uh, Alec mentioned. So for us, the focus is not engineering because they have that, but more on the business side, understanding the market, sales, business plan, intellectual property, accounting, basic accounting. Um, I'm, I'm ha happy to talk to people more about that and uh, nice to see all familiar faces, including Anoop, which I haven't seen in a while. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, Con congrats for moving to Virginia Tech as well. Be awesome. Thank you. Although yeah. not as good as UVA, but you know, just kidding. <laughs> Last but not least, Fred Cohen. Hi, I'm Fred. I run Angel at Exit, where we help grow companies. There's lots of free content on that site, which I encourage you to take advantage of. I also do consulting. My history is I started using computers when I was very young, which is many, many years ago, and uh, eventually got my bachelor's and master's and PhD. My PhD was titled Computer Viruses, which was the only PhD in cybersecurity, not in cryptography for two years before and after. So I am technically the four years of output of the United States in PhD in cybersecurity <laughs> for that period of time. Um, the virus defenses ended up being, you know, very worthwhile. And I think at some point, more than 75% of all the computers in the world were using the technologies that were first published in my research. Um, also worked on critical infrastructure protection, uh, deception for protection, digital forensics, and a variety of other subjects and topics, uh, usually very early in the space. And uh, at, uh, early on, you weren't allowed to patent things because, you know, software patents didn't exist, but eventually started patenting things and that started to work and starting companies uh, starting in the, I guess the 1990s, I was, you know, started one company every year with a different set of partners. And uh, then I became the founding uh, president of the Pebble Beach chapter of Keiritsu Forum, which is the most active private equity investment group in the world, or it was a couple of years ago and, uh, and so forth. So I do lots of stuff, very diverse and I'm here to chat. Awesome. Well, this is going to be a lively panel, I think. Um, so we, uh, when we discussed this before, um, we made the assumption that when we're talking ground zero, all all that really exists is maybe some core tech or R and D that um, that was built through uh, federal funding or or some type of research funding, and um, and so. The other thing that we decided about this panel is that rather than focus on questions about mechanics or building business, um, which are things that you can read uh, or talk to Angelo about, um, we really wanted to hear your stories, your experience, and then for us to pull out lessons learned and themes from um, from that discussion. So I think it's I think it's going to be pretty lively. So I'm going to start off with this lead question: Is um, you know. Why, why did you start your venture? Why did you do commercialization? And really tell us about what your experience is uh, that contrasts working in academia or industry versus how commercialization works in building um, a company or a startup from, from the ground up. And this time I'll call on Fred first. Okay, well, <laughs> so that was a complex question. And it was a leading question, and uh, you know, when we do this in court, you're not allowed to ask leading questions except in um, in, re in rebuttal, right? So, um, but I'll try to answer it nonetheless. So, early on, my goal was to be a professor and live the life of a professor, and so I ended up, you know, not patenting, not trying to commercialize technologies. People came to me saying, "Well, let's commercialize this or that," and I would say foolishly, I failed to properly engage them in that process. And as a result, 
the first couple billion dollars that I, I should have had in the bank aren't there. Um, uh, you know, the odds of success being what they are, okay, at least a thousand dollars. So um, I went to commercialization because I was not being successful in the academic world. Um, <clears throat> because of the nature of my work in cybersecurity, which was my focus, I got a lot of resistance from federal agencies, NSF, um, uh, you know, used to have a review process where anything in cybersecurity would go through NSA for one of the reviewers. And the NSA reviewers had a policy of always being neutral on anything. They didn't want to reveal anything. So they would always give you about a five out of 10, which means your average was never high enough to meet the threshold for anything. So cybersecurity research was systematically deprecated um, in that time frame. Um, I had a variety of incidents and stories that I'll tell you about some other time probably, uh, where, uh, you know, I mean, in one case, uh, my department had tried to stop my research and stop my access to the research facilities and did that when a New York Times reporter was coming to interview me. <laughs> the dean got involved and said, what would you like? <laughs> and that sort of thing. So academia, you know, not being very supportive of the sorts of things I was trying to do. And I've always thought of myself as a scientist, which is to say, you develop theory, but you have to do experiments. If you don't do experiments, if you don't try to realize the theory in practice, you can't confirm or refute its validity in, in reality. And you find out lots of stuff when you try to commercialize it. So I you know, ended up in that arena, had to earn a living. So I earned a living as a consultant for many, many years and uh, continued to work with universities in various ways and published you know, hundreds of peer reviewed papers and so forth. But that's how I ended up in it. <laughs> So what, what do you think um, was the most jarring difference between academia and the commercial world in terms of, or the commercialization, commercializing your technology, excuse me? Well, so the, the fundamental difference is that when you're doing something for commercial purposes, the idea is you put in resources and you get out more resources. So you put in time and money and, and whatever else, and the idea is to get more, <laughs> okay? And, and the more you get, the idea is not to spend it, the idea is to keep it and turn that into profit. In academia, in government, and this is one of the big problems with transitioning people from government in, into the private industry, is they don't seem to get it, right? They're like, no, no, I need to get more budget and then spend it all. <laughs> they, they don't understand this concept of, of profit. Um, and then the other thing is they always sort of want to do the work before getting funding. So they're, they're being Extremely helpful. Oh, I'll do all sorts of stuff. Sure. You know, it's cooperative and, and I'm getting paid by the government anyway, and you're in the government. We're all going to work together successfully. And so you don't have that competitive um, world that is the nature of business. And then the other thing is government, as opposed to universities, government is always working for the governance organization, right? So the United States government workers are working for the United States, the well-being of the U.S., a corporation is working for the benefit of the shareholders, which may be global. So they're, you know, in many cases, strictly at odds with each other. I mean, this had an effect, for example, on the export of cryptography. So when uh, export of cryptographic systems was not allowed in the U.S. or at least deprecated, what sensible companies did was they went to other parts of the world that didn't have those restrictions and did their cryptographic research and development there and then imported. So as a country, you know, the United States threw out the R&D in that arena in favor of letting other countries succeed. And that any business that wanted to be successful had to sort of follow that model or be US only. So that's just, there are many things like that. Gotcha. So um, that's a new, um, if you could add on to that, your experiences about, um, you know, why you're doing this and what you've run into in terms of what surprised you with commercial, trying to commercialize a technology. Yeah, I mean, um... I, I think I started from a place of science is one way of putting it, um, you know, with DARPA. Um, we were funding a lot of really interesting research and my, my role evolved very quickly. I, I was DARPA basically after 9-11 and uh, it evolved very quickly into offensive warfare uh, because as a nation, we were at war. Um, and so I was in all kinds of classified programs and basically <laughs> realized that we were defenseless as a nation against the kind of attacks uh, that we were experiencing. 
that's the good and bad of, of, of being in classified programs. It, the good is you understand the capabilities of the adversary. The bad is uh, you can't really talk about it, which kind of sucked. Um, and when I, you know, so coming out of DARPA, which, which we all do, and landing at George Mason, uh, you know, it was obvious to me there were some fundamental changes that needed to happen on the endpoint. And Angelus and I had many discussions about this. Um, and so, you know, I got a project funded out of, out of DARPA and, um, the whole idea was to build better technology, you know, which was kind of bullish in retrospect, but, um, that's, that's one of the mistakes I'd say that university folks make is they fall in love with their technology. Um, and we certainly tried super hard to get to market with, uh, you know, this fairly complex technology. Um, we pivoted probably two, three times and ultimately found um, a solution that was better than the existing solution, but not revolutionarily better. It was evolutionarily better, which it turns out was, was what you needed. Um, and so when, once we finally found what they call product market fit, um, it really took off, right? And we found a buyer in the process of raising money that uh, was one of these, you know, traditional old school antivirus companies that was being challenged by new starts. You probably heard of CrowdStrike and at some time Silence and some others. And we we're all the new codes were, were using machine learning and trying to uh, get out of the mindset of signature based detection. So we, we found the right product market fit and um, we found a company that really needed to upgrade its endpoint. You know, it's pretty cool that that product and technology is still out there in a pretty large scale with uh, Sophos's called Intercept X product. Um, but yeah, I, I would say I made far more mistakes, you know, when starting a company than I uh, I did good things in terms of business. But um, no, it was it was, a, it was a great experience, and uh, I think it's very very hard to do. What, what we're asking to do, what Angelus has done, um, because the incentive structure is all wrong at universities for, for this kind of endeavor. Uh, the way you think about markets and how to, how to get to commercial success is, is a different thought process. So um, yeah. Cool. That's actually a great segue um, for Angelus because you know similar question to you, uh about you know what your experience has been commercial you know trying to commercialize and you know maybe you can expand on some of the incentive structures that um anoop has just mentioned so I, I want to expand on what anoop mentioned that we all make more mistakes the real question is if the mistake is fatal so you know if you can survive the mistake then okay like you learn from it and you move on like in life i would uh, definitely double down on what uh that Anoop mentioned that basically the university is ill-equipped to basically promote these ideas. And in fact, in many cases, antagonizes the professors because they perceive the professors as doing something outside of what they should be doing. So for me, it was very hard to be in the tenure track process and at the same time have a company because um, half of my colleagues, they thought that I'm, I'm kind of crazy. Why is this guy doing this? And in, in fact, you know, it, it is perceived as a risk for your career. And it was told to me multiple times that this is not something that, you know, will help in the end. I, I don't think that this is the case. And I think that you learn a lot from the process. And I do think that, you know, there are what, what, what one thing that many people don't realize is that the experience that you gain from the process is actually invaluable for you to be able to succeed in the next venue. So as engineers, we're taught to be risk averse and failure averse. Whereas, you know, in a company and a commercialization, you need, to, you need to actually embrace failure and move on. The other piece that I will say is that as engineers, we were not trained to think about market, sales. Uh, we love our technology, as Anup mentioned, and that's a, in many cases, a fatal mistake. The reason being is because we cannot pivot. So sometimes the market needs something that's much simpler, much, much different messaging. And we kept stuck on, oh, you know, the complex thing is what solves the entire problem. Let's let's go with that. And you keep hitting hitting the wall, right? Because the customer doesn't buy it. And, and you're not yeah. getting it. Like, why are they not buying? This is a great idea. And they're buying- It's brilliant. This, <laughs> brilliant, right? They're buying this other thing that's so simple. Yeah. Right. 
sometimes simplicity exactly. is what the customer wants, right? Yeah. They don't want the complex no. things, messaging. Absolutely. Yeah, and absolutely. Sales, right? I mean, to me, if you ask me what I would change is I would have more sales and marketing. Like as an engineer, I thought that if the product is good, it's going to sell itself, which is completely, completely antithetical to how everybody else is working. Yeah. So educating, you know, the next generation to spend more time on sales and marketing, seriously understanding the market need and the customer, talk to the customer more. Like that's what I saw when the VCs came, right? They talked to the customer. I never thought about me interviewing my customers and find out what they think about the product, but that is the first thing that they did. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's a little bit, and you know, as an academic, you always think that the most complex problem is the most worth selling. <laughs> that's actually not true. <laughs> that's the worst thing that you can do, actually. So, yeah, that's what I have to say. And I don't want to take too much time, but that, that's sure. the point. I mean, I've not made those points, so I want just to reinforce them. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to pick up on that because, you know, multiple themes always come up about sales and marketing, uh, getting to the right MVP, most importantly, talking to your customer. And I know NSF, uh, you know, hounds go, go through i go talk to your customer. Um, but, you know, having seen that process, I think sometimes we don't talk to the customer properly. Maybe we don't iterate enough. And so this, this idea of go to market or, you know, this customer discovery and practice, I don't think, um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's well understood, especially when you're new and you haven't had a chance to learn from your mistakes. So I wanted to throw that question to, um, to you, Angelo, and then I'll go to Anoop and Fred after that, if you could expound on that and then, you know. So, so um, if you ask me, this is the most important question because right now, most of the people don't understand what is lead generation and SDR or Salesforce and why people use that. And I think in my opinion, that's the number one, because if you don't have customers, you don't have money to move on the business, then you have to depend on VCs, which they will end up, you know, drying out your stock option stocks, or or you have to end up relying on, you know, non-dilutive options like SBIR. But again, those are, they cannot help you scale. They run up to a point, like maybe a couple of million. And then the moment that you have like 20 people on your team, you, they cannot sustain you. So to me, it is very important um, and, I, and I don't know what uh, how NSF is doing it, but I have not seen a formal process of explaining the funnel for sales that you have to have lead generation, then you have to take those leads and actually convert them into like appointments and meetings, Zoom or in person. And then out, out of those, some of them are going to be converted into like pilots and some of the pilots will be converted to contracts. So that that funnel, which you know, I will tell you, like in my experience, the top the top part of the funnel is the most important, like getting clean leads. I mean, I don't know how many of the people in the call think of the, you know, sitting down with uh, five or 10 CISOs and having a, you know, giving five to 10K to to sponsor a dinner where they can sit in front of a CISO and get their, pick their brains, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the people that you like, but the people that, you know, mm -hmm. they might not know your company, but brand recognition. So most of us, and personally, as an engineer, I thought that it was a waste of money to do all of these activities. And I will tell you that it was the biggest mistake because not having sales is what basically can stamp you and shaping the engineering team not to be connected to the sales team and yeah. to the customer, which is like automatic. It's, it becomes a problem of converting the engineering value to market value. Mm -hmm. Let's put it this way. So at, at, at the end of the day, this is what most engineers are lacking and because they like the technology, but they, they, don't, they don't understand how this technology is going to go in front of the customer through sales. So the, the, the lens that the customer looks at the product is through sales and we are missing that. So sure. if I want to say something is that sales is like the people that you sell, your, you, you, you present your product are looking at the product through the sales lenses and we are not paying attention to what the sales people are saying or doing and how they're operating. It hurts the way that the product is presented and ultimately the sales process. Right. That's, you know, sales mistakes, it's, you know, you have an existential crisis if you don't have sales. So Anoop, um, could you build on that one? Yeah, and, and uh, Angelus is right, and customers are everything, but I, I also live the, the downside of that as well, which yeah, we did take venture money kind of early, I would say. And, uh, you know, my, my new startup, we're actually delaying taking an investment. Um, for some of the recent Sanchez mentioned around dilution, et cetera. But I will say 
before you did one mistake I've seen is anytime you're you're raising venture capital, um, investors want to see that money put to work to grow your sales pipeline, as you're talking about, obviously, uh, you know, and and getting in revenue, which sounds great, but the the real challenge is when you start spending money on sales and marketing and not getting sales, right? And what I see all too often are early stage companies hiring up sales staff and marketing staff before having figured out the product market fit. And so I, I typically look at uh, you know, companies on a journey where uh, you have an idea, you need to do the market research, you need to talk to enough potential buyers, get that feedback, do your you know, lean startup methodology if that's what you're doing, but early prototype, really spend enough time getting product market fit and so, for example, you know, right now I, I established a design partner program where we're not selling our product. We're giving it to people to make sure we're building the right product at the point in time where we feel like we've gotten enough feedback, enough looks that we have, you know, built a product people want to buy, which will measure by conversions, right, from design partners to, to customers. Then I think I could, I could go confidently to an investor and say, hey, you know, we, we think we got the right product market fit. Let's now put some money on this and, and invest in sales and marketing, right? So I think timing of that is pretty important. I was spending money on sales and marketing, uh, pushing on a rope, you know, and I think we've probably all been there, um, you know, and, and what you really want is, is market demand pulling on you. And yes, you got to create that demand one way or another, but yeah. Um. Totally, totally true. Um, product market fit, one of the hardest things I think for um, startups and commercialization. And I want to make a sort of distinction on what you said about product, product market fit, and that the technology and the product are not necessarily um, the same thing. So, um, so I wanted to, you know, take that over to Fred and have you kind of go over the experiences of what Anoop just said and what I just added about product, product market fit, and then really kind of listening to your customers to hone in on that and get it right. Well, I think I'm going to again, go against the trend here. I think what you're identifying here really is that people who do research at universities are rarely suited to be running companies or creating companies. And, and the team is probably the most important thing. So finding a good, chief executive, finding a good head of sales and marketing, you know, finding and, and, you know, and so forth, right? All of these things are things that you need to be successful. And you know, 90 plus percent of attempts fail and largely they fail. Um, so, I mean, generically they all fail because they run out of money. <laughs> but the reason they run out of money is because the team doesn't know what they're doing. Um, and so getting a good team is fundamental to this. So now you're, you're talking about product market fit and, and bad experiences and so forth. Um, the, <clears throat> so there's something called the engineer's disease and you can call it the scientist disease. It's not recognized by medical professionals, but the disease is there are a couple of symptoms. One of them is after the customer says yes, you would then explain to them why they would not want it. That's, that's thing number one. Um, uh, which then turns the sale into a non-sale. The second one is the notion that you can fully explain anything to anybody. And, you know, we want to do that. That's, you know, how we were educated and trained. But the truth of the matter is you cannot. And it's not from a lack of trying that I say that. <laughs> it's that there's always another question. There's always something that they don't understand. And the fundamental dynamic is that the customers buy things for reasons. They have motivating factors. They have decision processes. They have buying processes. And if you don't meet them in the marketplace, it's not gonna work, <laughs> okay? And one of, the, one of the problems that I see with um, many of these programs that I've seen over time through the government is that they just don't recognize this notion that you're a professor at a university, you're a researcher at a university, you should be doing research. 
to the extent you're doing development, you should be doing development. That should be handed off to somebody else. If you come in with a proposal that says, I'm going to be the CEO of a company, but I'm the engineer that designed it, and I'm going to do the marketing and sales and everything else, the answer should be no. <laughs> the other side of that is the funding doesn't support that. For the most part, you know, hiring a CEO is not that easy. Finding a good one and getting them to decide to put their time and effort into it for less than an actual salary is tough. So, you know, that, that whole process is difficult. We, uh, at Angel Exit, we just started something called CEOs for Startups. And this is a program where we're taking technologies and basically licensing those technologies and creating companies by finding CEOs that are good CEOs, a good match for running a company like that, that are looking to do that, and then providing them with everything else they need around that. So that's a process that at least has a chance of working, but realistically, this other approach I mean, you know, the, the failure rates are extreme. And the other thing is, it distracts you from the fundamental thing you want to do. I mean, you know, what I want to do is research. I like to do research. I sell things because I have no choice. I have to pay for my, you know, lifestyle. So if you have to pay for your lifestyle, you have to sell things. And if you're going to do it, you might as well do it well. Right? So, so, so uh, you know, if you're going to grow a company, you might as well grow one that you know expands quickly and has lots of customers and generates lots of money and so forth. Um, and as an engineering background sort of person, I'm systematic about everything. And the people that work with me, some people like systematic and some people just don't. So you know you have to find a team that'll get along with the people and and you know be able to work with them synergistically. And all of that human dynamics is tricky stuff. The alternative is to let it start, get it licensed out, get the company started with somebody else and be in the background, right? I think you have to recognize that, you know, you're the chief technology expert in the company. That does not qualify you to do marketing and it doesn't qualify you to run a company and it doesn't qualify you to do the financials and it doesn't qualify you to do the legal work and so on and so forth. So you need people as good as you are at what you do in every field where they do something. And those are the people you want to engage with and find. So I've now said more than too much. Um, definitely covered multiple themes there. Uh, the you know teams, team dynamic, uh, building from ground up. I, and you know, and for, for many of the technologists we know, they don't want to be the CEO sometimes. Um, sometimes they just want to be the CTO, VP of engineering. Um, I actually want to throw that kind of back to Angelo's here. Were you the CEO or the CTO of your company, of your startup? I was the CEO because I didn't know okay. better at that time. Okay. So, so I do, if you don't mind, um, because that is sort of the little bit of a counter example here, if you can tell us you know, by way of mistakes, um, build upon that uh, and, you know, share with us your experience about uh, first-time CEO, uh, transitioning from a C uh, technologist to a first-time CEO. So I would say that, you know, uh, being pure technologist and coming from an engineering background, I was not well equipped to understand basically uh, the other aspect of business, which is, as I said in, before, like sales, marketing, um, and also the ability to create the team that that Fred mentioned. So I think that part of the part of the gap in our education is that we are trained to to tackle the problem from start to end because it's usually it's a technology problem. But in reality, you need team members who understand other pieces that you are not trained. Right? I mean, you literally you are a commando team and you need everybody. You need the medic. You need everybody, and you don't have that when you start as a technologist, because you think that the only person that you need is the guy who will hold the machine gun. And you know, that's the best person, right? That's the one who, who does all the job. But in reality, there is support personnel, the guy who will, uh, you know, who will guide the boat, the navigator, like the medic, you might never need, but guess what? If you need him, you don't have him and, you know, casualties happen. So I, I, the, the example I'm trying to give is that, uh, you know, the company is a team effort and, um, we are not well equipped to be CEOs because the CEO needs to think about a more global uh, operational role, whereas a technologist is the person who creates the technology. And we love the technology, but we don't have a clue about... Um, I will, and I will, I will put out a very concrete example. You have the product now and people like it. How do you price it? What's the price of the product? How do you package it? What, what do you actually sell? 
I mean, as a technologist, you want to sell everything whole, whole right? Everything. But then if you talk to a marketing or a, a guy who does products, like if you have a products person, that person will tell you that that's a very bad idea because A, there are customers who might not be able to buy the entire thing. Other people might not need the entire thing. And also the pricing might change. Like, are you going to do it online? Are you going to package it as a software module or are you going to give it as part of a white label like channels? What, what is are you going to do? All of these things I learned being a CEO instead of actually having someone to guide me through the process. Also, the first thing that you realize when, I mean, and I brought VCs late and uh, Anouk had that, that experience early, but for me, I realized that I was I was wearing multiple hats, not just a CEO hat. I was a CEO, the CTO, the VP of products and sales, everything. And you do not know how to offload that when you start a company being a professor because you don't have a clue of these roles that basically as your company evolves and grows, they grow with you. But at the same time, you don't have to do all of that. In fact, I think that most of the people that I know, including students that are engineers, should not actually be CEOs. They, we should have someone who has an MBA degree who has a little bit more uh, detached view of the technology that allows him to basically place the product better. And, and that's what I will have to say. Got it. Um, so a new question for you, uh, because you you know started from ground zero and you built up mm -hmm. your team and um, you know, much like Angelo, you probably learned through mistakes and trying to figure out who is it that I actually need on my team. I, I guess I yeah. generically need a salesperson or I generically need a developer. But how did you how did you recognize that? And how did you go about picking the right team members for you? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think Angelo is right. And he forgot to mention he was also a professor teaching and advising students and publishing and presenting and all <laughs> in addition to everything. Uh, but um no, I, you know, trust me, venture venture guys will will help you with uh, telling you where you're weak and what you need to add to your team and so on. And and I'll I'll say this: um, I certainly had enough vanity to think I could do it all until you know I met actual uh, experts at marketing and sales and um, and brought on a, a partner essentially as a COO, and that's when we began to scale. Right, uh, so a little humble pie goes a long way in hiring the right people to help you. Um, you know, it, it was right. It's it's the team that really matters, or or maybe it was Fred who said that. Uh, you know, and and, and that's why uh, sophisticated investors tend to invest in teams more than they invest in products or technology, uh, because you know we we know whatever we bring to market. You know, or thought of what we bring to market, it's going to be wrong essentially. And so the the real question is, um, when it's time to pivot, are are you so, you know, adamant and stubborn that you don't you don't get it? You know, it, it's time to pivot, or can you can you read uh, what your customers are telling you and uh, build the right product? And you know, one thing we didn't mention on the team, which I I think is probably one of the most important hires is uh, good product management. Uh, good product management in many ways should be the counterbalance to uh, engineering. Uh, most tech startups start with engineering um, and um, engineers typically are in love with their own ideas. And so uh, the role of product management is to figure out, uh, marketing is not great at figuring out what market actually wants, but a, a good product manager will. Um, and we'll talk to enough um, potential customers will talk, will look at where the market is in terms of competitors, uh, figure out pricing, which you mentioned, a very important strategy, and develop the set of requirements on product, um, you know, that engineering works towards, right? And also uh, manages uh, customers and that interaction with engineering. So, you know, it's, it's a hard skill set. It's hard to find people who really understand it, uh, especially here on the East Coast. Um, but if you can get a good product management person, it'll save you a lot of grief later uh, in building the wrong product. Um, huge, again, uh, product, product market fit, um, trying to understand um, who, what the customer really wants. Is it is it part of the product? Is it full product? All, all very important here. So 
I I wanted the reason why I wanted to bring that up is you mentioned uh, the right product manager, the right team member is critical to finding that. And as um, someone who's might be new to that, coming from an engineering or science mindset, it might be hard to recognize what those skill sets actually should be. So how did and you know how did you figure out though how how did your VCs how did your network help you figure out what the right person should be uh cuz like you said they're hard to find uh the very good ones are hard to find um it's probably not as simple as just calling up a staffing firm or or recruiting firm and trying to find right. that person so if you could just kind of you know figure tell us how you did that and um were there any ways that you could kind of bootstrap that process because all of these processes all of these things are quite expensive and if you're starting out and you're at ground zero uh yeah it's not, you know, it's a lot, it, it seems like a luxury when it's kind of a necessity in some cases. Yeah, I, I think stage of firm really matters, right? So you will need different people at different stages of your firm. Um, and, you know, part of that goes toward scale. Um, what, what really matters, in my opinion, is experience at a similar stage company in a very similar segment. I think that's very important because they will have the experiences and the scars from doing this before. And, and that's super important. Um, second, I think is culture, right? Um, hiring the wrong person, especially early, can cripple a company because you're trying to set your culture, right? So uh, making sure uh, there's good chemistry in the team is, is very important. Uh, and frankly, cost is, is a huge consideration in the early days. Um, you know, in, in my current company, none of us are taking salary. Um, and so we understand that, you know, we're, we're going to do this until we take some institutional capital, but, you know, finding those people, and, and again, it's a hard thing to do, um, you know, we don't have second jobs, uh, but asking people to, you know, invest their time, their sweat equity to get it to a point where we think we have something that's worth investing in. So these were all, these were all factors, but I, I would, I would take experience and, cultural chemistry over everything else, uh, to be honest, yeah. Okay, um, Fred, I wanna take that question, similar to that question and throw it at you from, you know, you've, you've clearly had an investment hat on. When you're looking at uh, companies that are trying to commercialize product and you see, what are you, <laughs> what are you looking for in, in the My team? investment hat. There you go, it's a good hat, you should be full. <laughs> it has, it has, it's a whale on the outside, so. Nice. So look, stories I think are a better way to describe this. So um, the Radon Project is a company that um, I ended up you know, being the CEO of in the late 1980s. We went from eight to 250 employees in less than six months. The vast majority of it was manufacturing and measurement because it was fundamentally a measurement company. Um, sales and marketing, um, we started out mail order and I read a, a book, you know, how to become a millionaire or whatever um, that talks about how mail order works and it's just arithmetic, right? You, you know, send out so many pieces of mail that cost you so much money. You generate however many orders from that you take, you know, the cost and so, you know, subtract everything out, right. And you get the cost of the product and you ship out the product and so forth. And so, so it's very easy to calculate. And, and the trick here is to get the right advertising piece. So you experiment with it. And once you get up to a threshold where it's generating more than it's costing, you have a profitable company and you can just accelerate that as long as you have a big enough market to do more. And then you can continue to experiment to improve it over time. So that's what we started. At some point we realized that we needed to go into retail. So we went um, to find sales corporations. So we found representatives, manufacturers, reps that were in the home and housewares manufacturer reps business and engaged a set of them each in a, in a niche and they could take it to that niche. So it wasn't very long before we had a test kit um, in every Kmart in the country. So, so you know, our, our boxes were everywhere. You could find them in, and also in, you know, BJ's and, and, you know, home, whatever, you know, all of the big box stores. And that was explosive growth, right? So, so I don't think there are many people that ever got to that level of explosive growth. 
along the way, there was lots of insanity. And, and I'll just give you one example. Um, there were end caps that we needed for giant food in Washington, DC. You know, an end cap sits on the end of a display and, and the box sits in there. And we needed to get those end caps to them by a certain time in order for them to put the end caps on the shelves for that week when the boxes were arriving and everything else. And there was a big penalty as associated with not getting it there on time. The time was like 6.30 a.m. on a Sunday, <laughs> okay? And so the problem is we didn't have any end caps. So we went and found end caps in Chicago. The end caps were from a, another store called Super Value. Well, Super Value is a competitor with Giant Foods and they have the Super Value logo on it. No problem. So we, we sent a truck. We had one of our people was a driver, you know, uh, so he drove a truck out to pick up the boxes, which we paid for by American Express, <laughs> very handy. Um, um, as the boxes are coming up, coming back, we're going to our printer on a Friday night and printing a whole bunch of labels to go over the super value labels. The boxes arrive, we open the box, you know, a little assembly line with 30 people, you know, all night pizza party Saturday night at the Radon Project. They, they take the stuff out of the boxes, they go to put the labels on top, and it turns out that the P from super value is sticking down below the label. So it's a red P sticking down below the label, what do you do? Okay, so the artist on the team who had done all this stuff said, magic markers. We need magic markers, we will draw with the magic marker, we'll cover up the bottom of the P on every one of these end caps. Okay, now this is, as we're taking boxes off the truck, we send people out to the all night stores. Remember this was a long time ago when everybody wasn't open all night. Send people to all night stores to find magic markers. So we have five or 10 people going out finding magic markers in the right color, bringing them back. And you know, every single box, you wipe out the P, write in a magic marker. Then you have to, you know, it's all glued on. Then you have to stuff it back in the boxes, get it back in the truck so you can deliver it on time. We finished at about two, 2.30 in the morning. The truck heads to Washington, DC gets there five minutes before the deadline with everything, okay? So that's, that's the sort of thing that you encounter when you're in business. That, you know, the technology of the product, no problem. But man, you know, oh my God, the bottom of the P. <laughs> so so that's, that's the world of, you know, meatball business startup where you don't have lots and lots of money and it's two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday or a Sunday and, you know, you got to get it done you get it done. So I don't know if that answered your question, but there's a whole team of people. Everyone's doing their part and there's creativity along the way and interaction along the way and assignment. And, you know, you go here, you go there, a lot of coordination, you know, that's how it is. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, team dynamic is uh, fundamental to solving these unexpected problems. I think one of the, one of the issues with startups is, it gets really hard in ways that you don't anticipate. So you need to be able to, you know, work together to kind of solve those problems. So um, Deborah, I, I wanted to confirm we have 10 minutes left on this panel. Okay. So I yeah, wanted to, okay. I wanted to leave the remaining 10 minutes for any kind of Q and A um, because uh, the questions I think um, coming from the group will probably be far more interesting than uh uh, based upon what they heard than what I'm going to go over. So I see the questions. How about this? How about somebody raise their hand if they want to go first and ask a question? We might have at least one in the chat box as well. I do have one in the chat box. I'm going to go in reverse order then. It, it <laughs> seems like I've been reading. It seems like kind of chatter in the chat box. Yeah. Um, but while, while you do that, I, I, I just wanted to comment on Fred's story from the 80s. Um, I knew what mail order was having lived that time period, but I'd never actually experienced it from the company side. Um, so pretty fascinating there. Uh, of course, the same thing exists today with digital marketing. That's what Angela was talking about with the, with the lead gen. Um, and, uh, you know, what my last company was a fairly mature company. We were doing over 50 million in revenue and, we basically almost got it down to a science because we had product market fit. We knew if we spent this amount of money on uh, you know, digital marketing campaigns, it would generate this many 
inbound leads and signups. And then it really was a matter of conversions, right? Conversions through the pipeline. And uh, what's amazing to me is the amount of, you know, uh, science is the wrong word, but there is a lot of marketing science that goes into converting uh, a lead into a prospect, into a qualified prospect, into uh, a POC, into a sale, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a funnel, right? Uh, so it was sort of interesting to hear back in the day, uh, people had worked that out for mail order. I I'd, I'd, I'd never even knew that, but I, I get it. Right? So, you spend so at the top of the funnel. Same calculation for email. You just have different, you know, multiple. Yeah. Yeah, different yeah. cost per email, different probability of getting re returns and so forth. Yeah, same yeah. thing. Very All cool. right. So Jeremy has his hand up as well. Okay. All right, Jeremy. So I'll, I'll do it since nobody else is, is asking a question. I'll ask. So, so true story. Um, I, I was the uh, responsible for export control, among other things, in a startup. And I had all the right licenses in place. Uh, uh, 5D002, if the, any of you remember what those are. Um, and I got an email, a call one day from um, a salesperson, or maybe it was the legal department. I don't know. Anyway, they said, uh, we want to send a copy of our software, uh, which included some encryption technology, to the um, uh, Ministry of Nuclear Power in North Korea. Is that okay? <laughs> and my reaction was exactly what, what Fred's reaction is. And, and I said, no, 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 we're all going to jail if you do that. And, and then I got a call back half an hour later, and I was wrong. The, the person says it wasn't the Ministry of, Nor of Nuclear Power in North Korea. It was the Ministry of Hydroelectric Power in South Korea. And it's like, oh, okay, that's okay. We're allowed to do that. And so my question is, in addition to that being over, to me, that's a rather amusing story because nobody went to jail. Um, my question is, does this sort of a thing, how do you plan for that? How do you plan? How do you teach your salespeople what they, or, or legal people or whatever, what they can and can't do? And especially for salespeople who are motivated by how can I make another sale? And they'll do anything to make another sale, uh, including sending software to the Ministry of Nuclear Power in, in North Korea if they think they can get away with it. How do you deal with that as part of a startup? So you need a control system, right? Yeah. Businesses are basically control systems. And anytime somebody's going to do anything at any level, it has to be that there's a process by which they get whatever appropriate approvals there are. And you know, you train, right? Part of that cycle is you train people on what the rules are. And, and I've had salespeople that get too aggressive. Look, if you send an a unsolicited commercial email to somebody who hasn't requested it and you don't put the right stuff at the bottom of that email, it's $2,000 per instance. And you try to explain that to people who do email marketing and they say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. It applies to you, okay? So you need to have people that understand the legal issues that are in those positions that can explain it to you and identify, no, no, no. So this has to do with being a professional at what you do. If you're a pro professional, you know, in charge of sales and marketing in a company, you need to know the rules for your profession. And if you don't know how to be a professional in that field, you need to, to take the lessons, learn how to act as a professional and act that way. And it's the same with everything else in a business, right? You can't just willy nilly go do stuff. That's why you may be a technologist, you may have a really cool technology, and you may decide to do an experiment with that technology on the general public without bothering to get informed consent. And we've seen this at universities plenty of times. We see it in commercial companies and you, you've heard screams about it lately, right? The psychological support system that's now using chat GPT without telling anybody, right? That's how you get in trouble. That's how you get in lawsuits. That's how you go to jail. So having a professional there that's done that for their living, that's experienced, that's come up through the system is how you get rid of that stuff. The, challenge is that lots of startups are starting with 20 year olds and it's not an ageism starting with 20 year olds 25 year olds who just haven't had the experience and some of them are really smart and they've gone through all the training and education and they can do that really well and they know the rules and they follow the rules but most of them not so that's just part of getting a good team is looking at their experience and then managing it right the ceo's job is to manage that process to make sure that when that goes wrong 
you detect it soon enough and you fix it, right? For cybersecurity people, plan, do, check, act, right? It's the same thing. So I'm gonna um, bring up one more question. This one's directed to Angelos. And um, you mentioned talking to customers and this is from Anita. She's asking, what is the, what's been the best way you found to talking to future customers? Is it a demo? Is it a one pager, a coffee chat, et cetera? So I, I would say all of the above. So in my opinion, there are three ways of, of reaching a customer. Like, I mean, and it has to do with the level at which you want to interface. So the first thing that you need to understand is who do you talk in a company? For example, if you have a privacy product, you need to go talk to the chief privacy officer. If you have a, you know, uh, who is your buyer, basically? Who buys your product? So then at that point, you have to interface uh, at the right level. In many cases, as engineers, we're thinking that interfacing with other engineers is the best approach, but it's actually the incorrect approach because they don't have buying decision uh, abilities. So you need to identify within a company and organization who has the, who makes the recommendation and who has the authority to purchase the type of product that you're selling and who is, uh, the competition. I think that having a coffee with one pager works better than having a long um, for for the to get your foot onto the door. Then you can have the that makes the the prospect as Anup mentioned qualified. Then you can have a pilot or a demo, and then you can have like a discussion about a long term contract. The other thing I want to talk a little bit about is at different stages of the company you need different people, and that's many that's what many of us did not realize, and Anup touched on it. But, um, you know, while the VCs can bring the right people, you, we have to be able to interface with them and sometimes a difficult uh, job of firing them. So a lot of us like to hire people, but I've personally realized that competent CEOs and C-level executives are the ones who can actually do the firing more than the hiring. And I know that it sounds cruel, but I mean, uh, I look at it as a cost reduction strategy in terms of if the person doesn't work, you're you know, inhib inhibiting their career, but they're also inhibiting your growth. So you have to basically uh, bite the bullet and, and, and fire them. And you might find the perfect person when you're a medium-sized business or a small-sized business, but that person might not be able to scale in a different role when you grow. So you need to bring someone more experienced, like for example, in a CEO position. And that creates a lot of um, gripes within a company, but you need to be able to make those decisions because otherwise you won't be able to scale. So for us, I will tell you that we changed six different accounting firms as the company grew from, I don't know, like from $100,000 sales to like 15 million. So we had to grow basically. And also some of that has to become passing from outsourced to in-house. So that's another decision that you have to just make at a point or, okay, which of the services now I have to, have to bring in and how much of that. There was one other question that Chris um, brought up and he may have mentioned it twice. He's, he would like to know how the panelists go about identifying the people to work with and how do you figure out how to get in touch with them and who is suitable to work with and who is not? Uh, we view it as a sales process, right? So, you know, if we're trying to find people, we do it just like, you know, if we're trying to sell something from somebody, if you're trying to buy something from somebody, you're trying to figure out who the right person is, you have a sieve. You start with lots of opportunities, lots of people, you communicate with them, you you know measure them with whatever your metrics are to determine the ones that are gonna be suitable versus not. There might be minimum requirements and so forth. And then you sieve it down. Uh, the other path is relationships. So you talk to people you know that are in a similar industry or you look on, on Crunchbase or somewhere like that for a recent exit, a recent successful exit in a very close competitive space. And that'll have people who just stopped doing that old job or are looking for their next thing. And also likely if they were high level executives and it was very successful, they're likely not uh, strapped for cash. So they'll be able to work for six months or a year or two without pay to help build this again. And they'll have an ilk to do that. So, so there are lots of different techniques. It's not easy, right? Like I said, we have CEOs for startups. We've a program we've started. We had 25 people show up last week for a call to discuss the opportunities. We've had four follow-on calls with, with the people you know, scheduled. We've had one was a no-show to the follow-on call with no explanation. One we're now in negotiations over one of the particular niches that we think might work well. And the other two we're talking to next week. There's no shortcut to doing this. 
There, there are, this is Alec jumping in here, if you don't mind. There, there are some things that you can do and some rules of thumb to follow. And we will talk more about these tomorrow. We'll have a, there's a presentation that, that uh, Fred and I are going to give at the end of the uh, session that's going to address matchmaking, not map. Fred's not crazy about that term, but that notion of being able to find, uh, be able to partner up technologists with the, the uh, folks that they need to be partnered with to make TTP opportunities move forward. Yeah, the, the, the only uh, thing I'd add on to that is think about what your skill sets are and what they're not and look for people to complement your skill sets. Um, so if you're strong on the technology side, maybe it's someone who's strong on the product and marketing side. Um, you know, and again, I, I think he points out, Juhei, Ju that product and technology are different, right? Um, same, same thing around operations. Do you know how to run a company? Do you know how to keep things on, you know, on a tempo? Do you have the discipline to manage people and so on and so forth? If these aren't your skill sets, you need, you need to find people who uh, believe in what you're doing and, and want to come join you uh, with those skill sets. So if there aren't any more questions, um, thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Oh, sorry, I had to unmute myself. All right, so um, let's say you understand who you need and there are candidates who have you. They will want to know what it is that you're doing. And if there is IP involved, how do you protect yourself? Now, don't tell me uh, NDAs, all right? Or, or is that the only way that you have in mind? You don't have to tell them how. You can only tell them what, right? So many engineers struggle because they don't understand the, the difference between the what and how. You don't have to tell them how you do stuff. You just have to tell them what you want to do. And, and I mean, all of us have walked that rope, right? VCs will never sign an NDA. So guess what? NDAs mean nothing. You can have them. It's a good business practice to have them if you can, but they cannot be enforced. So well, you have to be very careful. That's exactly why I was hoping to hear something other than NDAs. But um... yeah, I, I would reorient your question a little bit, Chris. Um, I think most technologists and engineers um, overvalue um, their IP. And um, you're far better off telling them everything about what you do and how you do it to get their interest. Um, if you're worried, like who are you actually worried about is, is really the question. Do you, are you gonna meet someone who's gonna steal your idea and take it to market? If, if that's the case, go hire that person. You, you know, they're hard to find. Even for our larger competitors, we almost don't care because they're too busy building out their product plan than they are to steal anything I'm doing. You, you see what I'm saying? So if, you're, if you have the opportunity to talk about what you do, how you do it, and get someone really interested, be as forthcoming as you can. And by the way, they might tell you that, hey, that was, that's not a great approach. Now that you mentioned it, have you thought about this other approach? So that, that process of sort of holding things close to your chest because you think it's so valuable will probably inhibit you more than doing the opposite, which is really sharing what you're doing and getting the feedback on it. I find 99.9% .9 of people wouldn't know what to do with an idea and how to bring it to market, right? So you have very little risk is really, what I'm saying is a lot more downside of keeping it secret than there is upside in sharing it. I'm not saying publish your code, that's a little bit different, but you know what I'm saying in conversations. Yeah. So, so cybersecurity is fundamentally different from some other fields like medicine. In, in medicine, if you have patents, <clears throat> those are usually very good, right? In terms of protection, assuming that they are sufficiently generic that they block others from doing things that are as good or as inexpensive or as efficient or whatever. In cybersecurity, there's probably nothing that you can patent today that hasn't been published already or something pretty darn close to it. And they're also very easy to avoid. So um, most of the patents that we see are way, way later than the innovation. So for example, in the deception space, I have patents from the late 1990s. So they're now expired. And 
um, you know, some of them were very good, right? Because nobody else was doing that deception operation or had figured out the multiple address translation is a really good example. It's being used um, by all of the major um, cloud service providers as, as a mechanism. So there's an example of a mechanism where the patent was worthwhile. It doesn't stop them from using it. They're going to use it. So once you have that patent filed, hey, talk it up. <laughs> Go ahead and use it. If Cisco does it and builds out, you know, a hundred billion dollar business on it, you know, I may only get a hundred million out of it, but that's acceptable. Um, there's trade secrets. Trade secrets are different. When when people fill out our forms to describe their intellectual property, we tell them, tell us what the trade secret, what the benefit is. Don't tell us what it is, right? So if my trade secret is I have a new annealing process for shoelaces so that they tie themselves and stay tied even when you put pressure on them to untie, except when you pull it the right way from both sides. That's that's my super secret sauce and somebody's process, right? And But I can tell you that that's what the secret does. That doesn't tell you anything about how to do it, right? You could spend the next hundred years trying. <clears throat> so tell us what it does to benefit the company, right? So tying the shoes benefits the company because you know, our studies show that 97% of the people that tie their shoes dislike the process and there are 400,000 back injuries per year. <laughs> you know, and we can save you know, $40 million for the insurance companies. Right? Whatever the path is to benefit the business of that trade secret, that's what's important about that trade secret from a standpoint of running the business. So, so then you have copyrights and copyrights, if you don't register them, they're of no value and, and you have... Um, trademarks and such, which have to be registered to be able to be enforceable to punish somebody over their use and, and so forth. So there's different types of intellectual property that you protect in different ways. When somebody says NDA, I say, no, thank you. Having said that, our website and all of our contracts say, we promise not to tell anybody and you promise not to tell anybody. Right? That's what they say. You know, so what we have in our meetings, our advisory meetings are confidential to the parties to the meeting. So we say that and mostly people follow it. If it comes, you know, the only way this comes to fruition is if somebody cheats, you find out and you try to sue them. And then the question is, what's the value differential? So, so the front end of it is, are you preventing a competitor from coming after you? Or are you preventing yourself from succeeding? And then the other side is, why would you want to stop competition, especially in an early market, right? You want barriers to entry and stickiness, but what you would love to have is competitors helping to educate the market, right? Because usually there's plenty of opportunity in the market. If it's a big market, you're going to have three competitors at the end. But if you spend your first five years of this business educating the market, and then somebody else comes up with their version, they're going to benefit from all your education. So the the communication of it. Another thing is in academia, you're trying to publish the results. Chat GPT is a great example. There are lots of competitors to chat GPT. There are lots of other technologies that do something very similar, almost identical. Chat GPT is now famous. Everybody is looking at chat GPT. Everybody's talking about it. They have all the buzz in the world. And now they're starting to charge things. They're starting to get contracts. They have billions from Microsoft coming in, not because they're the best product, but because they got that recognition, they got the public relations benefit above their competitors. So, you know, keep it a secret, nobody knows. So nobody uses it, it doesn't get adopted. Your technology to practice is there is no practice, right? So I don't know if that helps, but. Well, I was, um, I mean, I was under the impression that if you do not have some kind of protection, then you're not going to get anybody to put money on it. I mean, you said that we need to have uh, support, financial support to do to do things, but then uh, you have to be able to explain to someone what is he or she buying. Right. So, so sorry, but, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to. Um, we're running out of time. I'm going to need okay. to catch up. We have a session tomorrow with Fred on funding TTP um, opportunities that this right. discussion would fit um, right on into. Um, so if we could just table that for tomorrow until tomorrow, um, and Fred can talk about it um, then. 
Okay. Thank you so much. The panel was awesome. Um, we got a lot of great um, information from there. We're a little bit over, but we have a um, bio break coming up. So if we take about 10 minutes um, and when we come back, Rob's going to tell us um, about some things going on at NSF. So we'll come back about um, 405, 406 um, and start back up. Okay. Thanks.
So Anita, you had forgotten about those, uh, the record of our meetings. Take what I forgot minute. about was the cool drawings. The uh, I forget what you call those type of people that capture like real time. Yeah, as you're speaking, they do the little cartoons, the visualizations. That that is really an amazing skill and very useful. Yeah, he did a fantastic job with it. But uh, there's really a lot more as I was going through. Honestly, I had forgotten some of these things too. That we had these resources out here and. And I, I think if I had been a little bit more on the ball, put your fingers in your ears, Rob, if I'd been a little bit more on the ball, I probably would have used more of those resources in this workshop because it's a, there's some really good work out there on the web page. I knew we did really good work. I didn't re remember how much of it we had retained and structured and formalized at the ends. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to see it. Yeah, that was very cool. I think we underestimate also some of these folks who do design thinking and facilitation, like for you know design facilitation. That that's such a great skill to elicit comments and you know create energy. And we don't appreciate that often in our world. Yeah, we all think we can do it. It's like TTP. We all we all think we got these all these degrees. You know, we got more degrees than a thermometer. We ought to be able to lead a discussion, right? But the fact is, a little facilitation really can make a big difference. Those notes were very, very powerful, very important. I, mean, I thought they did a great job. He did a great job of documenting what we did. But you know, the sad thing is we used it a lot when we were writing up our report at the end. But uh, I haven't looked, really looked at it very much since. And that's, again, we've got another workshop coming up. And we need to probably need to spend a minute maybe tomorrow talking about what, what this project entails, which does include another workshop opportunity. And maybe we'll go back through some of that material at that point. That might be a good thing to do. See where we are. OK, well, I think everybody um, is back, so we'll turn it over to Rob and he can give us some updates from NSF. Great, thank you so much, uh, Deborah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Beverly. I'm a, a program officer at, at NSF, and uh, with me today is uh, is Jeremy from uh, Satsi, who's the cluster lead. And Jeremy, please feel free to to speak up if there's anything uh, you'd like to to jump in on. Um, you know, uh, I would say that I found myself vigorously agreeing with many of the things that the panelists were discussing uh, and uh, expressing opinions on most recently. Um, the uh, charge from, from Alec uh, was, was really about, uh, you know, what he asked us to do was to, to, to think about what doesn't work for, for TTP. And I think there's a session on that tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, this is just one humble, uh, you know, view of some of the, the things that have been um, successful and, and perhaps, uh, you know, advice for those in the audience who might be thinking about some sort of transition uh, activity um, so that uh, you can better position uh, your work uh, for some of these uh, targeted opportunities within, uh, within NSF. And then also tell you about uh, more generally uh, if you're not aware, some of the other TTP uh, type activities uh, within uh, the NSF. Um, and so by, by way of that, um, let me just say, you know, NSF is a large uh, place um, and there's, uh, you know, many different pathways uh, for transition. This is um, actually a, a bit dated of a, um, of a figure, but one of the, um, you know, to, to take a step back, if you think about um, some of the work at, at NSF, you know, some of this is just sort of basic uh, foundational, you know, research. If you think about, you know, commercializing uh, you know, work on a, a, a large, you know, radio telescope, or if you think about uh, commercializing a neutrino array, right? I've heard a lot of, you know, discussion about commercialization uh, in the preceding discussion. You know, not all of the, in fact, you might argue a, a good chunk of what NSF does is, is not really, uh, it's not really within NSF's purview to be thinking about um, you know, transitioning that per se in the way you all think about it. Um, however, um, you know, some programs, uh, in particular SATSI, uh, the Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace 
uh, area at, at NSF, which does do foundational and basic research in, in cybersecurity and privacy, um, you know, much of that work is much more uh, immediately uh, applicable to, to transition, right? And so that's why, for instance, there is a specific pathway for cybersecurity. Um, I uh, have uh, been a program manager in, in SATSE for a couple of years now and, and managed um, a, a chunk of the TTP portfolio. So I can get, definitely give um, some insights uh, from that perspective. And that's really what I'm going to, to talk about. Um, but uh, the reason for this slide is just to emphasize to those in the audience that might be thinking about a transition uh, type activity that's not cybersecurity, um, or if there is an activity that's at a different level of maturity, right? Or if, uh, you know, I heard, uh, I, I believe it was Anoop talk about SIBRs and, uh, you know, these kinds of things where, um, you know, all of these are targeted uh, in different ways to different uh, levels of, of work. Um, they have slightly different goals. Um, there's also activities such as the NSF Convergence Accelerator, um, which have very um, sort of targeted, uh, areas that they're they're looking for work in, um, and some of these follow a, a much more uh, sort of cyber type uh, approach of doing um, ecosystem discovery, uh, training, um, you know, matchmaking, as it were, these kinds of things. So I just want to make sure that the the audience is is aware that at NSF we sort of have a complementary portfolio of uh, transition activities, and that there's multiple pathways. Um, so you know, again, uh, the the charge was was what has not worked for TTP. Um, I just you know I, I'm inherently a, a an optimist, so I had to change this to uh, you know uh, more more political speak, which is you know one NSF program manager's view on some of the challenges in TTP. I think uh, several of these things were already articulated by the by the panel, but you know we certainly see some of these. Um, as well, but I, you know, again, I take a fairly uh, positive view on this, and and in fact, in a moment, I have a slide on uh, a few of of the success stories, um, just because we like to give uh, folks inspiration, right? Um, of you know, here's others you might follow their lead. Um, here's NSF research that was uh, you know supported, started as basic research, and uh, you know achieved. Um, uh, transition, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, the first one is is a, 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 a an observation on yield. Um, you know, it's certainly the case in in our view that you know some of these transition activities do indeed fail. I, I wouldn't say that that in any way condemns the the system or or is you know saying that the system isn't working as uh, intended. This is you know somewhat uh, somewhat to be um, expected, and you know I think it's important for us to to, to recognize. That um, and uh, you know part of part of that is is also thinking about timescales. At least one observation that that we've had, um, and, and I know that this is a bit different in some of the sort of you know hyper accelerated commercial spaces, but it, you know at least uh, for for many activities that we've observed. Um, they, uh, you know, the transition does require, you know, both time and, and continuity of, of, of effort. And, you know, something that may look like a failure on one time scale may indeed turn out to be a, a success on a, a different time scale. And this is particularly true for some of the sort of basic, uh, you know, innovations and, and technologies that, that get uh, produced by NSF researchers that are really just too early for the market. Um, you know, I heard several folks in the the panel, uh, you know, make a, a very astute observation that, you know, researchers want to, you know, inherently, they're like, oh, I'm super smart. I've got this amazing idea. Um, and, and indeed, it's this question of, of evolutionary versus revolutionary, um, you know, things that, uh, that were more revolutionary um, sometimes take much longer uh, time to, to, to reach market uh, or to be transitioned. Um, I also, and I did do these slides before uh, listening to the panel, so I, I'm just trying to sort of do a, a bit of uh, impedance matching here, but the, you know, the incentives is, I heard uh, the panel talk about this as well. 
Um, I believe that was was Angelos uh, making some comments about that, but uh, this certainly resonated with me. Um, it, it's definitely the case that uh, in our observation at NSF, the, the, the folks that are creating the technology uh, may not be incentivized or even able to transition the technology. So this is certainly a, a challenge that we have observed. Um, and then last, uh, in terms of challenges here, um, you know, I would say at NSF, we think a lot, of course, about resource allocation and funding. Um, you know, the time and continuity that's required uh, for success often requires significant funding. Um, and, and, you know, for the for the, the more commercial, you know, people in, in the room, um, you know, the, the kinds of money that, that we're talking about really may not be um, enough to achieve the, the escape velocity that, that some of these organizations might, might need. Um, okay, um, in terms of uh, SATSI in particular, um, I, you know, again, part of this presentation is really just to try to give a bit of guidance to folks that are thinking about TTP proposals. Um, I have looked at um, a large number of TTP proposals over the years uh, and have, uh, you know, run a, a large number of panels. Um, NSF, of course, uh, has uh, a, a rigorous peer review system, right? This is uh, fundamentally different than, uh, say, uh, a VC, right, who may for instance, uh, simply be looking at the strength of the team, and and as folks uh, discussed, they 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 may uh, have uh, you know frankly less uh, interest in even what the the technology is, right? Um, and, and indeed, uh, you know, being able to pivot is is super important. But the, but this is NSF, right? So um, you know, the some of the proposals, uh, how not to write a proposal. Well, you know, a. a, a uh, one thing to to, to definitely uh, not do is to, to to have the double negative is to don't identify the technology or the innovation being transitioned. Um, you know we've seen this um, before where uh, it's it's simply not um, articulated. Um, uh, they the proposal might not discuss the current level of technology readiness, right? So you you have this technology, right? But um, what is the current state? Um, third, uh, the proposal doesn't provide evidence that the technology is novel and, and promising, right? Um, again, NSF, many NSF researchers are doing sort of core basic research. We're not looking for, for evidence that the technology works at scale or has been deployed in production or things like this. Um, but we, we are interested that there's been a, at least more than just a, a paper written about uh, the particular technology, right? Um, we're interested in some sort of uh, validation or some sort of testing or some sort of uh, evidence that there's there's you know something there with with merit. Um, the fourth is don't identify a transition target. Um, don't identify a transition platform or a transition uh, partner, right? Um, you know, uh, you can um, promise that you will uh, transition this work, but we at, at NSF want more uh, evidence uh, indeed that this will uh, potentially be successful, right? And the, the way to do that is to specifically identify where it's going to be transitioned, um, at least initially, to give us a sense that you have an idea of where uh, it, it could go. And, um, and, and then conversely, provide evidence that this partner or platform is going to be willing to, to, to help with this transition. Um, and then finally, uh, the proposal doesn't describe the expected state of the technology uh, after the, the transition, right? So where do you expect to be after uh, this activity is, is funded? Okay, um, so I this next slide, again, in the, the vein of trying to remain positive, um, there's a, a couple of things wrapped up in here. Um, I, I wanted to, we've, and I just picked a few of these, um, and, and you you can argue with me why I why I picked these or I picked the wrong ones or or what have you, but I, I had um, uh, some specific reasons for doing, uh, picking, highlighting the ones that I actually did highlight. Um, and again, I would say, you know, TTP takes a, a, a somewhat, uh, and NSF takes a somewhat expansive view of, of what it means to transition. Um, indeed, uh, to make this slide, you have to define what uh, success means, right? Um, and for, for us, we often define success as uh, there uh, is an external user 
um, who has uh, in some way uh, ad adopted this uh, technology and is, is using it. Um, and indeed, um, you know, commercialization is a pathway for transition, but there are other pathways, right? There are, are, are pathways to transition um, that, uh, that, that are not uh, purely commercial. They might be transitioning into government. They might be transitioning into a, a public good or an open source um, thing, things of this nature. So this um, IOTA censorship outage reporting work um, has become sort of, uh, it, it has become a production service. Um, it's used by a large number of, of folks to try to understand how censorship and outages are um, occurring uh, in the network. Um, and so this one has uh, transitioned in the sense of it's been made into a production service. It's not commercialized, um, but it has many uh, outside users. Uh, the in toto work um, and uh, the, the tough supply chain uh, software security uh, supply chain work, um, of course, has has uh, received significant attention recently. Um, this work was was out of NYU um, and has uh, had lots of, uh, of of basic research funding, but also TTP funding, and they have transitioned that into a uh, a Linux Foundation project. Uh, it's being used by Microsoft, IBM, VMware, uh, and, and Docker. Um, let me let me uh, you know there's there's um, some some work on a honeypot that's actually being used in RNE networks. Uh, on a uh, on a particular security operations center uh, in production, uh, there's the app census work uh, that's uh, out of out of Berkeley and ICSI um, that's being uh, used for understanding mobile uh, app mobile app privacy compliance. Um, and uh, you know not only is this a company, but this work uh, has resulted in uh, the PI testifying in front of Congress, um, and and lots of the results of this have had um, impact. Um, we've, uh, you know, fund, fund, excuse me, funded some work uh, over the years uh, in, in improving the production tour, uh, the the anon anonymity network. Of course, that is not a commercial project product. Um, and then there's been some work uh, on on secure password management um, from Yules. Uh, this is a, a company uh, Oso. One of the most recent ones. Um, that we've liked to uh, to uh, to talk about um, again. That has had one of these very long trajectories. Uh, is uh, a a, um, a and what originated as uh, Vern Paxson's uh, Bro intrusion detection system uh, from from Berkeley that uh, has uh, morphed into something called Zeek. Uh, and morphed into a commercial company called Corelight. And some of the uh, core technology of Corelight and, and of this NSF funded uh, research that, that got a boost through, through TTP um, has now resulted in their core technology um, being integrated into, into Microsoft's operating system and, and being deployed on you know, order of a, a billion global uh, endpoints. So this is all by way of hopefully, uh, you know, answering the converse question of, you know, well, what not to do for a, a TTP or, you know, what, uh, what, what doesn't work for TTP, but indeed to say that some things uh, have, we have had some success uh, stories in this space. Um, okay, uh, the, the next thing I wanna do is really just, uh, and, and I don't have a ton of slides, um, I'm gonna shut up uh, shortly here, but I did wanna make folks in the audience aware of, um, the uh, various uh, sort of transition activities that um, are happening at, at NSF. And I alluded to this earlier. Um, again, NSF's core uh, mission is, is really basic research. Um, and you know, I, an ideal TTP uh, is use-inspired and, and translational. I heard, um, uh, I heard, I believe, Anoop earlier make a comment along the lines of, uh, you know, uh, taking your technology and deploying it in production, you, you learn quite a lot. And indeed, this is sort of the virtuous cycle that we like to see uh, as, a, as a, a research organization, uh, a scientific research funder, sorry, um, is that the experience from the technology maturation or the deployment should, should feed back into the basic research itself. Um, and so, you know, this is a, 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 um, a matrix that uh, 
our division, uh, our, our one of our uh, directors used to like to, to show where there's um, sort of at, at one end of the continuum, the, the Neil Bohr's type research, that's the, the pure basic research, which, which may have zero relevance for immediate application, right? Um, but has high relevance for generalized knowledge. Um, there's the more sort of empirical science from, from Edison, pure, pure applied research. Um, which has uh, much stronger relevance for immediate applications. And a big push uh, for the NSF is in this uh, top right quadrant, um, sort of the more Pasteur uh, type of research, um, where we think about use-inspired basic research, uh, which, uh, which sort of straddles between these uh, two uh, ends of the, the continuum. Um, to that end, I want to tell you quickly um, about a couple of transition initiatives at NSF. Um, if you're not already aware, um, oh, sorry. Um, right. Um, so this is uh, this is uh, a slide that our, our director at NSF likes to give. Uh, the reason I included this was really because the, the director's vision, um, Dr. Panchanathan, um, includes, so there's lots of problems, but the vision includes um, uh, on the right here, partnerships, uh, people, and, and translation. So this, the reason I included this slide is really just to um, affirm uh, NSF's uh, sort of deep commitment uh, to these kinds of transition activities. Um, this is becoming uh, something that's more of a I would say an increased focus of some of what we we do, um, and 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 not to say that it's um, to the detriment of our of our core um, work, but indeed it's it's additive, right? Um, this is uh, things that are are adding to to what we're doing, um, and so NSF uh, uh, earlier uh, in in 2022. Um, formed its first new directorate in, in over 30 years, I believe. Um, so we have all of these different divisions uh, at NSF, you know, everything from, you know, geosciences um, to, uh, you know, social and behavioral sciences, you know, engineering, math and physical sciences, biology. Um, and across all of these is a new directorate called TIP, which is uh, the Directorate for Technology, uh, innovation and, and partnerships. Um, if you haven't heard um, about this, um, I, I encourage you to, to look at it more um, after this or, or reach out to, to, to Jeremy. And I, I, I will caveat that with neither Jeremy nor I are, are in the TIP division, but we, we do work closely with them. And um, they are really um, tasked with this idea of uh, you know, trying to enhance the, the use inspired and, and translational research across all of these different divisions, not just uh, computer science and, and, uh, and the size division. Um, so uh, again, by way of saying that there's multiple pathways to achieving uh, transition. Um, one of the new programs, this was actually the first program that was launched out of TIP, um, was something called um, POSE or, or Pathways to Open Source Ecosystems. Um, just quite, quite briefly, let me just say that um, one of the sort of introspective activities that NSF engaged in um, resulted in us realizing that there are there were several um, activities that were uh, had it, had their roots in in basic NSF science um, that uh, that were able to have large sort of outside impact and um, achieve this escape velocity of becoming a self sustaining uh, ecosystem right um, uh, having uh, outside outsized impact. Um, having a distributed community of, uh, of contributors and users and um, uh, serving a wide range of needs. By way of example, um, you know, we like to talk about, for instance, um, Apache Spark um, had some of its roots um, uh, in, uh, in NSF-funded research and is now widely used um, all over the place and has a, a rich open source ecosystem. Um, things like the, uh, this, the, the RISC-5 uh, instruction set architecture, um, has similarly had um, roots in, in NSF basic research funding um, and has achieved uh, this status as a, an open source ecosystem and even things uh, as diverse as if you think about MIT Scratch, um, this is a, uh, this is actually a, um, a way to help uh, folks learn and, and children in particular um, learn how to do programming. 
Um, so it's more of an educational um, effort has um, become a, a rich open source ecosystem. So Pose uh, is intended to, to bridge this gap between uh, researchers producing an open source artifact, you know, the canonical example being, oh, I just threw my stuff up on GitHub and trying to make it uh, uh, achieve this uh, status as an open source ecosystem. Uh, so Pose is intended to enable the early and intentional transition from an open source product to an open source ecosystem. So this is another pathway um, and we're creating all of these different pathways, hopefully for the community uh, to, to, um, to, to better uh, transition your work. Um, this is my last slide, um, and, and this is really uh, just to also point out um, an, that many of the different programs, and you may see more of this going forward, many of the different individual programs are, are also emphasizing um, transition. So for instance, um, another program that myself and some other folks help manage uh, is called CC, um, and this is within the realm of uh, scientific cyber infrastructure. And one of the uh, program areas in there is about transition to cyber infrastructure resilience, where we're, we're looking for activities that um, again, are more on the translational use inspired side uh, that will improve the robustness and re resilience of scientific cyber infrastructure through testing, evaluation, hardening, validation, and transition of novel cybersecurity research. Um, so, so that um, hopefully answered the question of, uh, you know, the charge of uh, what hasn't worked in, in, in TTP, at least from uh, some uh, of our observations, um, and also tell, hopefully tells you about some of the uh, new opportunities um, at, at NSF. And I very much appreciate uh, the time to speak with you and happy to take uh, any questions. Uh, I see, I see, sorry. And, um, Oh, cool. Jeremy's still on the line. Okay. Um, uh, is that uh, Fred? Is that you? Fred. It is me. Uh, please, sir. So I noticed that you, you know, the things that you claim as successes, um, and I, I wonder how you evaluate success. And, and in particular, I wrote it down because you got to try and remember stuff, right? The, what metrics do you define in advance for success? And I asked this question because I'm wondering whether you treat your own measurement of success in the same way and of evaluating programs in the same way as you treat um, people that apply, right? Because if I apply for, for funding, for example, you'll have very explicit metrics, you'll have review processes that have you know, peer review and so forth. You'll have, and if I don't have those definitions of what it means so I can differentiate between you know, failure and success, right? Then it's, it's not a well-defined scientific endeavor and we wanna you know, get rid of it or something. So that's my general question. And I know that you have wonderful answers to it, but I just had to ask. I, I don't. Um, and, and, you know, uh, the, the snarky side of me uh, wants to, to, to make a flippant answer about like, well, you know, if we just did it randomly, we might have the same level of success, right? Um, it so might actually be better. It, right. Um, but I'm going to try to refrain from the snarky answer. Um, Jeremy will slap me upside of the head. Um, the, um, but let me, let me also articulate a challenge that we, by way of, of sort of non-answer, let me articulate a challenge we have uh, at NSF, um, which is uh, on the NSF side, when we evaluate these uh, proposals, you know, we do, as you said, have a peer review process, which we're very keen on. Um, we try extraordinarily hard to include on the panel and the reviews um, individuals who have both um, sort of technical chops for in the particular domain. Uh, of the proposal, um, as well as folks that have some uh, some um, qualifications and experience in reviewing the um, the you know the the transition piece of it, right? Um, you know, and uh, this this is not necessarily like you know VC type folks, but it might be people that have. Uh, previously had a successful TTP. Um, we have had panelists from industry who have, um, you know, a much more, uh, much more distinct view as it were, right? But one of the problems, and, and I'm sure Jeremy can, can um, affirm this, is, you know, you do have the panelists, no matter how hard you try to normalize them, and you say, look, the point of TTP is not to do 
basic NSF research, the point of the, the work is to, uh, you know, tra or of the, the pr proposal is to transition it, um, you will still get reviewers that, uh, that say, this isn't novel, this has been done before. Um, and, and I heard some of this on the panel where folks said, um, you know, uh, and I believe Fred, you said it, like, um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, novelty is just one piece of the, pu the puzzle, right? So um, we try very hard to, to have consistent metrics. We um, try very hard to outline the review criteria, okay, for these proposals. Um, but at the, the end of the day, there is a, a human who is, is scoring it, and sometimes it just doesn't resonate with that particular individual. Did I answer that question at all? Well, no, or, maybe, maybe you answered a different question. But my question was sort of much more specific, right? So when you do scientific research, you say, here's the evaluation criteria for my results, right? And, and you, know, you have statistical results, or you say, you know, here's the definition of success. And, and it has to be testable to be scientific, right? Whereas what it looks like is you have these sort of declared successes, but you might have something underneath it that's not just declaring success, but rather, you know, we had metrics, we had, you know, predetermined questions that had to be answered one way or the other, so we could have a refutable hypothesis that it was successful and demonstrate the actual successes against the hypothesis. And then of course, adapt the program over time so that, you know, you improve it the science, right? So, so Rob didn't give a snarky answer. So let me give a snarky <laughs> answer in, in his place, because I think it addresses what you're, you're pointing to, Fred. Um, and, and there's, there's a probably apocryphal, but not totally apocryphal story that floats around NSF about an award that the, the report at the end of the research came in. And, and it said, uh, we started a company, and and that was the entire report. And the um, program officer returned it and said, "You know, you have to provide a little more information than that. That's not good enough." And and so the rev revised version came in. We started a company. It's called Google, um, and that, in fact, more or less is. I, I mean, it's. It, it may not have been quite that brief, but it's more or less what happened. It's frequently hard to know whether we're being successful, even at the end of that project, it wasn't clear that Google was going to be the trillion dollar behemoth it's become. Um, it's sometimes pretty hard for us to know how to measure success in research. Right. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Now I was going to say, I was just going to thank y'all for your time and, and for that great information. Um, and unless there's something else, we're going to move on to the next topic. Rob, are you Good. Uh, absolutely. And um, I, I'll put some more comments in the chat, Fred. And thank you so much for rearranging your schedule to um, present today. Okay, so we're going to uh, move on to the last session um, for today. And I will try and talk fast so that we are out of here on time um, at five o'clock. Um, let me share my screen, um, and I'm going to talk about um, the TTP assessment and the TTP canvas. Can everyone see um, the PowerPoint? Take that as yes. Okay, so um, the um, TTP, the Trusted CI TTP program. Um, was established in 2018 through an NSF grant to help enable researchers to transition their cybersecurity research into practice. Um, the NSF and of course other funding agencies do spend a lot of money and researchers devote a lot of their time, energy and effort into technologies that are never developed beyond the labs. So funding has continued for the TTP, um, for the Trusted CI program um, with several follow-up awards. Um, the program, the Trusted CI TTP program has developed a set of materials um, that they have made publicly available to help researchers and practitioners with transitioning their research into practice. Um, these tools include the Technology Readiness Level Assessment Tool, the TRL Assessment Tool, and the TTP Canvas, which are designed to help in the planning and decision-making required for the TTP process. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, 
I have included that link um, in the chat if anyone's interested um, in accessing those materials. Um, the technology um, readiness level assessment tool um, was based on the TR TRL processes that are had been already established by both NASA and the US Government um, Accountability Agency. The TRL assessment tool um, allows researchers to assess their research to help identify its current state in terms of its readiness to transition into practice. The tool allows the researcher to identify any gaps that exist in their operational deployment readiness. The tool also helps the researcher to develop a plan to uh, process through operational readiness. And this includes setting priorities for the changes that are needed to help mature the technology and capturing the state of the different system requirements to determine which ones are most in need of improvement. The assessment process is an iterative process because as improvements to the current technologies are made, reevaluating the state can help track progress and reevaluate the current priorities. Um, the TRL assessment tool can be used to describe the overall maturity of a technology, describe the maturity of each of the different subsystems and components that provide the functionality of the technology, discern which components need the most attention in order to make the technology operationally viable, and communicate to stakeholders regarding the current state of development and the and future work. The TRL assessment tool allows researchers to capture the current state of the different components of the system that provide the ne necessary functionality and allows researchers to identify where their efforts need to be focused in order to mature the technology. The first part of the TRL assessment is the TRL assessment workshop, wor worksheet, sorry. To complete the worksheet, the overall system um, is broken down into ind individual um, subsystems where each subsystem is a collection of the related components that work together to serve a distinct functional need requirement for the system and to serve its intended purpose. The workshop worksheet captures the subsystems, the components of each subsystem, a TRL readiness level between one and seven for each component, the justification for the given TRL TRL level and a description of how each component is implemented and its source. The definitions and requirements for the scoring level we're talk, we will talk about on the next slide. Each component of each subsystem is individually evaluated for a distinct TRL level, and these individual values will then determine the overall TRL for the system. So the basic um, seven levels of TRL readiness um, go from one to seven. We're gonna look at some more details on the next slide, but basically at one, you have the basic principles of the system observed and reported. Um, two, you have the concept um, formulated for the system. Three goes into um, proof of concept. Four, your proof of concept has been validated in a laboratory um, experiment. Five, you have a prototype that's been demonstrated in a relevant environment. Six, you have the actual system. Um, and qualified through testing and demonstration. And then for seven, you have the actual system that's up and running and proven successful through um, operation. So there's some more details um, provided by the trusted CI team um, as to the hardware activity descriptions, the software activity um, descriptions, um, and exit criteria of each of these levels. This um, information as well as the worksheet um, are available on that website. So I'm not gonna read um, this entire screen to you on how to make decide on the seven, def, the seven, seven different levels. Um, so here's a basic example of a um, TRL worksheet. And this is for a hypothetical software technology that relies on a web application front end. Um, so the web application is broken down into the various subsystems. There's the user interface, um, data management, and then on the next slide, you have the core software um, and the development process. Um, an example of the subsystems is further, each of the subsystems is further broken down into the individual components. For example, the user interface is made up of the Apache HTTPD, the Apache server, um, the REST API endpoint, which allows the application interfaces to access and use the data or exchange and use the data or exchange information using the REST architecture. 
the web GUI or interface, and the mod DVD database module, which handles the connections between the Apache server and the SQL databases. Um, each of these components is then assessed and provided a TRL assessment score um, using the definitions um, on the previous slide. So for example, the Apache HPP um, D um, has a score of seven plus um, because this is a widely used and available open source product. So this system has been proven through its operation. Um, if you look at the REST API endpoint, that is only given a score of four because the basic API calls have been written and tested. So the research has been validated in a lab environment, but it hasn't been demonstrated on a fully functional prototype. Um, you can see the scores for the other products. Um, you may find um, in doing this that a core, of, a core piece of functionality may be well understood, but the peripheral functions such as the IO, the HCI, and the APIs may not be as clearly defined. Um, so this may require a much more complete understanding of the entire operational environment for the system to appropriately um, complete your workshop. Worksheet, I keep saying that. Um, when you've completed the TRL assessment um, for all subsystems and components, you will not only have a complete list of the components of your system, but will have an estimation of the readiness of each component, including how each component contributes to the overall readiness of the technology. This will then provide you with a list of components that are most in need of additional attention and effort and to, to, and to help you identify where the most important implementation improvements are needed. In many cases, this is simply the component that has the lowest TRL number. Unless these um, low components only provide ancillary functionality within it, which in itself is not key to the core value proposition of the technology. Once the components that need improvement have been selected, the exit criteria and activity descriptions for the current TRL level, as provided in your definitions, can be used as a starting point to determine the appropriate development goals for this specific component. Um, in this example, um, looking at the web interfa interface, the REST API endpoint has the lowest score of the four components, um, receiving the TRL score of four. Um, in looking at the software activity descriptions and exit criteria given in the definitions, um, level four includes key um, function, functionality critical software components are integrated and functionally validated to establish interoperability and begin, begin architecture development. Um, to increase to a level five, the REST API endpoint must reach the level four exit criteria of testing the performance of the low fidelity prototype, um, demonstrating an agreement with the analytical predictions and documented definition of the environment. Um, so you see the steps um, that are required to move each um, level forward. Um, as a reminder on the, uh -oh, going the wrong way, um, the TRL assessment tool, um, this is an iterative process. Um, as improvements are made within the system, um, it's valuable to track the progress and reevaluate what your current priorities need to be as they will change as you make improvements. So you can assess the readiness level of the technology again um, and identify updated list of components that may need improvement. Um, the results of your TRL assessment can be used to identify the components that need the most work. Um, and again, as a communication tool to describe the current state of your technology and why a specific development effort might be needed um, or requested. The second item is the TTP Canvas. Um, this is a business model Canvas-based approach that's similar to and modeled after what's used in i um, which is the NSF Innovation Core business model Canvas. Um, i is geared towards developing a business. Um, Michael Chambers and I have worked on that for several years, and he may talk a little bit more about it tomorrow. Um, but the TTP Canvas is modified for when the goal of TTP is not necessarily establishing a business. Um, so the TTP Canvas is a tool that researchers can use to clarify the purpose and or value of their research. Their, their target clients, which has been brought up several times today um, as to whether or not you have a um, product that people will buy, um, activities to move the research toward operational deployment, um, which is the transition to practice, and the development of a sustainability model. 
Um, the TTP Canvas enables the researcher to brainstorm and develop a model to explore ideas for transitioning their research into practice. This is also, a, also an iterative, 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 sorry, it's a long day, um, tool that can be continuously updated as you get new insights um, about your um, product and about your potential clients, value propositions, solutions, costs, um, and resources. Um, so here's an example um, of a TTP Canvas. Um, to use the TTP Canvas, you'll wanna answer some basic trigger questions for each section. You see that there's eight sections here. Um, and looking at your research problem, what are you trying to do? Articulate um, what your objectives are, try and avoid not using jargon here. Um, as far as innovations, what is new in your approach and why do you think it would be successful? Are there other approaches that are being used to solve the same problem? If so, how is your approach different? Um, for your target users, who cares about your product? If you are successful, what difference will it make? Um, who is gonna use it? So who are your customers and who will benefit from your research? Um, number four looks at your user challenges. Um, what challenges do your users have? Um, of those, what challenges will your solution address? One of the things that's mentioned a lot in i um, is going outside and check outside the building and checking with your customers to make sure what you're developing is what they actually want. Um, so what challenges do your customers or clients have that your product can actually um, work for? Um, five, value delivered. How does your solution address challenges for your users? Um, and how does this benefit your users? So how will your solution address the challenges that your target users have? Um, six, activities. What do you need to do in order to deliver um, your solution? These are activities in order to develop and deliver um, your solution based on your resource research and identify and acquire the resources necessary to do um, that activity. Um, resources and costs. Um, what do you need to do? How much will it cost? How long will it take? Um, and what resources will you need? These could be personnel resources, um, which could be students, um, professional staff, contractors, um, or infrastructure resources, where you're talking about web hosting or network infrastructure or cloud services, um, high-performing computer resources, um, et cetera. And finally, your funding model. Um, how will you get the funding um, and resources that you need? What options are available that can provide you the resources that you need? Um, will you charge for your product or service? Um, how much will you need to charge um, in order to be successful and break even, if not make a profit? Um, how will you set up a research partnership if you're going to do that? Will you um, submit a grant proposal to a funding agency? Um, et cetera, et cetera. However, you're going to, that, again, we'll talk about funding um, tomorrow. When you're filling out um, the TTP Canvas um, or planning for future efforts, um, some examples can be helpful for providing a starting point. Um, some examples, example activities have been provided by the trusted CI team um, that include things a researcher should expect to carry out in order to successfully transition their research into practice. Each of these should be considered when you're developing your TTP Canvas to see if they're appropriate for your specific research. The first of these is customer discovery, um, who identifying your potential users, um, who would gain value from your research, who will your customers be. Um, the second is your challenge, uh, customer challenge discovery which is identifying your operational challenges for your potential users. What are their challenges? And test the, your hypothesis about the value that your research can provide to them. Why will they use your research? Um, third, solution development. Envision and develop the solutions to the customer's challenges, whether that be hardware, firmware, software, um, or services. Um, fourth, um, develop a prototype. Um, advance your research to develop a prototype with documentation that can be deployed in a user activity. Um, five, user environment, I'm sorry. Five, develop a pilot with the user. Um, this is a TRL level of five. Um, by completing the prototype and testing in a relevant environment to prove the viability and the value of the research. Six would be deliver the model. 
Um, this delivery model should be determined and clearly communicated um, to the user as part of your solution, whether that be on site, um, on cloud, um, or mobile delivery. Um, part seventh activity is um, partnerships for the development or, or the delivery. As you develop your system and or your delivery model, you may figure out that you can't do everything um, and that you may need strategic partners to develop or deliver elements of the solution. You may not have all of the resources, the time or the skills um, to complete all of the elements. So you may need to partner with someone who does. Um, Eight, you're gonna identify the resources needed to assist with the coding prototype pilot and delivery of your um, research. This can be students, interns, partners, other collaborators or investors or other research researchers. And nine, identify and develop support channels for marketing delivery if you intend to expand beyond a single cl client. How are you gonna market and how are you going to deliver? Those are some suggested planning activities. It's certainly not um, a comprehensive list. Um, so again, the, the TT, TRL assessment and the TTP Canvas um, were tools to assist researchers who are interested in transitioning their research to practice. Um, the TRL assessment will help you gain the current state of your research and the TTP Canvas can help clarify the value your target clients um, activities to progress into practice and a sustainability model. Um, these tools um, and all of the um, items I used are publicly available through the trusted CITTP team. Um, I inadvertently skipped over the first slide somehow when I was clicking through. Um, I do want to say this was taken from the information on in the trusted CITTP playbook, which is published on that website um, and created by Ryan Kaiser and Florence Hudson. Um, of the trusted CI team. So I wanna make sure to give all the appropriate credit there. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay, if no one has any questions, we have an extra four minutes left. So I'll give that back to you into your day. Um, we look forward, I think we had a great day with some great discussions. Um, we look forward to having an equally um, interesting and uh, informative morning. So hopefully we'll see everyone tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Central time. Oh, thank thank you. you guys. See you tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you all. Good evening. Good evening, thank you.